greatness doesn't just happen. It is created one step at a time. A skyscraper starts with one plan. A masterpiece starts with one simple brush stroke. And a student fully prepared to lead and serve begins with one community pulling together for the benefit of all. One teacher can inspire. One caring adult can support. One idea can change everything. Over the next five years, Columbus City Schools is embarking on a path guided by our students and their families. To our students, you are the reason that we're doing all of this important work. It is important for us that you are successful. Now we are more intentional. Now we are focusing on the priorities that we believe are important for our students right now. A portrait of a graduate is Columbus City Schools, community coming together, stating that these are our hopes and dreams and aspirations for our students. We must put our students out front. They can do it. They have demonstrated across our district and other places that if you provide for them the environment for them to thrive, they can do the unimaginable. Now we have four priorities that we are focused on. Columbus City Schools would be whole child focused. And what that means is that we will focus not only just the academic, but also social emotional well-being of our students. Equitable opportunities for all students in Columbus City Schools means that every student, regardless of your background, will have an opportunity to be successful. Strong learning communities in every region means regardless of where our students go, we have to make sure that our students are learning in 21st century facilities. Authentic engagement is so important. Why? Because we want to make sure that everyone has a voice and that we are intentional of making sure that we are including all stakeholders. In order for these four priorities to be realized, it is important that we have a foundational system of support. So there is a role for every one of our employees to play to ensure that we have 21st century classrooms, our students are leading the way, and that portrait of a graduate is realized. The past two years have been incredibly challenging, but we know that as one community, working towards one goal, that we are up to the task at hand. Every journey begins with one step, and our journey begins today. So we're in this together. Be committed to the next steps with us. We're gonna be committed, we're gonna be transparent, but together we can be transformational. are far smarter than I was when I was your age and you will be far smarter than any of us ever will be. And this is because your generation is so innovative, so creative, and you understand your role and your civic duty in making our society better. Senior to sophomore will definitely benefit you in the future, and I am so happy that you guys chose to take your senior year to pack it on with so many college courses. I know it was hard, and you're probably so glad that it's over, but I promise you, it was worth it. I was a part of Ohio State's um, Academy, and whenever I had an issue, uh, Ms. Raspberry was my first person that I went to. You know, she is really an amazing person and she is very passionate about what she does. I couldn't ask for a better support system in this program and I'm just very thankful for the program and thankful for you too. <laughs> Thank you. But most importantly, I now understand that taking a course shouldn't just be about making the A's but actually learning to love like whatever course we're taking because that will really 
pull you through even and like in the times you don't want to study or like I really like this class so I'm just going to do it anyways. I actually found myself becoming really complacent in high school classes. It was really easy, there was no studying, it was just do the work and you get an A. So I'm really grateful for this program to allow me to challenge myself and kind of gain back my drive that I had lost and get me to who I am today. Exposure changes expectations, but experiences changes lives. We always have to make sure that we give our students more and more experiences, taking them onto college campuses. They can do it. Just listen, we have students that are going to be the next scientists, the doctors, the lawyers. You are the next generation that's going to make America great and greater. It's because of you and your foundations that you have here at Columbus City Schools and at the post-secondary schools that you've attended.
I hope that the students feel a sense of accomplishment. I hope they feel proud about what they created. I hope they feel like they, you know, really can do anything. I want to dance for the rest of my life because I've been doing it up until now, so I still want to do it forever. You taught me this in Dance One, that dance is like a universal language. And over time, I've really realized that my role here has become not necessarily teaching them about the art form of dance, but using dance as a way to understand yourself in the world. And when you understand yourself, then you are able to do more. So I can say personally, the connection you have with your students and that you want them to do better. You want them to push. You don't want them to fall like under any category. You want them to push forward and her sense of being a community. I can, I'm about to cry. <laughs> you can really see that, you know, you want to be a community and you push for that. You push for your students so they can have a community. <laughs> I told you Dance Ensemble is family. So you push for that. You push for the family, you push for us being together, even though times may be hard, you know, the, the being there, present in time and space, was really something that I appreciate. Life is gonna go back to normal, and what you gonna do when you look back from four years in high school and you know you didn't still push yourself? Enjoy the moment, enjoy what you have, like be here, like be grateful for what you have, cause like, we couldn't have done this, we didn't have to do this, or like we were, I probably wouldn't be able to do this. COVID kind of makes you do things you don't want to do, or like forces you outside of your comfort zone a little bit. Be open, be different. It's okay to not just think everything's gonna be one way. It's okay to change. I grow every day, so it's not like I'm just stuck in one position. I've learned a lot about myself through this whole experience. It takes confidence to be a leader, to be able to step out in front of people and say, you know, this is the way that this should be done. Um, because you have to be able to take criticism from people that are doing that as well, because everyone's looking to you. If you ask for things, if you are open and you're willing to like put yourself out there just a little bit, that things will come to you. Challenges do not change who you are. They reveal who you are. And what this has revealed is that during this time of great challenge, creativity still happens. Creativity still emerges. And that has been a very cool thing. So this challenge has not changed who we are. It's just revealed who we are. I actually have a heavy interest in music. I really love music, and like as soon as I got into this classroom, I just fell in love with music. And it's something I've always that always pushed me. I listen to it every day. It drives me. And I talked with my mom, and she told me that like uh, my my family background is music heavy on my mom and dad's side. 
So that, it, it makes total sense on like how quick I'm able to pick it up. I find enjoyment out of watching videos and seeing other producers produce and just the different sounds they bring to the producer community. So I just use that and I try to be as versatile as possible. I didn't even know he was a basketball player because I didn't even know like he was tall because everyone's on the same little size screen. I did get to know him as a music producer and he would make great beats and very interesting, unique sounding beats. Like not just the same loops other people were using, but different loops, making his loops, chopping his loops in different innovative ways, just having a whole unique sound. I like beats that have very good bounce and weird bounces, so I like unusual beats that have weird sounds in them, but if it sounds good, then I like it. <laughs> Why is that doing Good evening, everyone. I am calling our regular board meeting on September 6th to order. Mr. Treasurer, please call the roll. President Adair. Present. Ms. Beckerly. Present. Mr. Brown. Here. Mr. Cole. Excused. Dr. Pierce. Vice President Reyes. Here. And Ms. Vera. Here. You have a quorum, Madam President. Thank you. Can you please uh, stand and join me in the pledge? Thank you, uh, board members. On tonight's agenda, we have uh, one part public participant on an agenda item. We are expecting a report from our superintendent, a no report from our auditor, a report from our treasurer. Uh, we have several items on board matters. We have uh, two notice of public hearing on reemployment of retired employees. Uh, we have our consent agenda this evening. We have no speakers on our non agenda items. Uh, and no executive session, and then we will adjourn. Is there a motion to approve our agenda? There's second. Second. Then a motion and a second. Uh, any changes or um, comments about the agenda? Hearing none, and without objection, our agenda is, has been adopted. All right, we're going to go ahead and do a public comment. Um, our first speaker is Stephen Hardwick, here to thank, thank you to the board and its facilities team for working to put AC in cause. Board action, vote yes on the contract to provide air conditioning throughout cause. Good evening, Mr. Hardwick. You have three minutes to address the board. Well, thank you, um, President Adair, members of the board, um, Dr. Dixon. Um, I do wanna say thank you for getting the air conditioning contract. I know it was a long process and I urge you to vote yes, but I also wanna specifically thank Dr. Barnes and. Um, Alex Trevino, who in the spring, when they realized that they weren't going to meet what they hoped to get, they, they'd hoped to get it done this past summer, and they realized they hadn't, they came to cause virtually via Zoom and stayed as long as they had to. They explained the process, walked people through the contracting issues, and really took the, and answered everyone's question, which made it a lot easier for me, especially for me to be able to explain to people why it was, what happened, and why we have a much better chance of it. Um, why it's, as you could never promise anything with 100% when it comes to construction, but you could tell that they were doing their best to make it happen. And I wanted to say thank you for that and please vote yes and, and acknowledge the help of Mr. Trevino and Dr. Barnes. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move into our superintendent's report. Madam Superintendent. Yeah. Thank you, President Adair. Tonight our pro provide you with some updates on transportation, as well as our 13 buildings undergoing HVAC upgrades this year. But first, I'd like to share with you some highlights from our first full week of school. I had the opportunity to visit 16 schools last week. Several of the schools I visited were those undergoing HVAC upgrades this year, which I'll discuss more in a few moments. But those schools were Coleraine Elementary, Como Elementary, Fairwood Elementary, and Johnson Park Middle School. And thank you to those board members who um, joined me as well. Prior to three of our strategic plan, strong learning communities in every region was on full display at Hiltonia Middle School. Several classrooms receive renovations and students are engaging in career technical education programs, including construction, small engine repairs, 
and family consumer science. At Columbus City Preparatory School for Girls, eighth grade student ambassadors displayed so much poise and confidence as they provided a tour of the building, sharing information about their courses, teachers, and classrooms. It was quite impressive. I also had the opportunity to speak with students and teachers and staff at three high schools, Briggs, South, and Beechcroft. Other schools visited including Oakland Park, Avalon, and Cassidy Elementary Schools. And Arts Impact, Medina, World Language, and Mifflin Middle Schools. I was absolutely thrilled and encouraged by all the positive energy among our students, teachers, and staff. Also, we welcome more than um, 3,700 kindergarten students in our elementary schools on Friday, September 2nd. Many of our community partners were present to ensure our young learners had a fun and memorable first day experience. We will welcome our pre-K students this Thursday, September 8th. I have school visits planned throughout the fall months, and I look forward to meeting more students, teachers, and staff across the district. Now I'd like to provide an update on our buildings undergoing HVAC updates this year. 13 HVAC buildings project began this summer. We've created a chart that outlines where we are with each project. As you can see, seven of the schools have their HVAC upgrades completed or a nearly completed with just some small spaces left to go. These projects include Broadley Elementary, Coleraine Elementary, Como Elementary, Mays Elementary, North Linden Elementary, Westmore Middle, and Woodward Park 6th grade at Walden. Next, we have six schools where the HVAC has continued with expected completion dates this month. These projects include Fairwood Elementary, Johnson Park Elementary, Johnson Park Middle School, Valley View Elementary, West Broad Elementary, West Gate Elementary, and Yorktown Middle School. Now I'd like to provide an update on transportation. Although we wrapped up our first full week of school with many positives, we also encountered some unforeseen challenges, specifically with transportation. And we found three areas to address. One would be our recent routing software change, outside service providers, and the bus driver attendance. As you're aware, um, we, to increase our routing efficiency, we invested in a new software this year called Alpha Route. While this software aims to provide maximum routing efficiencies, we have found that it has removed our ability to manually add students to routes. We have had additional high school students opt in since the original deadline, and without the ability to manually add these students, we are working with Alpha Route to finalize routes with those additional students included. We have contracts with two outside providers, VAC and Buckeye Transportation, to assist in, bus, in the busing needs of charter non-public schools, which consists of 50 routes. These providers supply drivers and vans, but use our routing software. So we are experiencing similar issues. As we work with Alpha Route to finalize routes, these issues will also be remedied. Finally, we are experiencing um, some issues with our bus driver attendance. And we know that our bus drivers uh, are valued, um, part, a valued part of our uh, organization. Uh, but after all of our recruitment efforts throughout the summer, we currently have 556 active bus drivers plus 20 supervisors to cover additional routes. We also have nine drivers in training and another 12 who started training today. We have 614 routes combined for Columbus City Schools and Charter Non-Public Schools. 
with our two contracted providers covering the 50 charter non-public school routes, we have enough drivers to, con to cover all routes. However, when attendance was an issue um, last week with an average of about 18% of our drivers calling off each day. So supervisors covered some of these routes and many of our drivers had to double up, um, lengthening their routes and to get students to and from school. So really thank you to those drivers who were able to cover those additional routes and to our supervisors. And we value our drivers greatly and we're thankful for the work that they do and we are working with OPSI to better understand the issues surrounding attendance and we are continuing to proactively recruit more drivers. I understand these transportation issues are causing challenges and disruptions to our families and we thank you and truly appreciate your patience and understanding as we work through this as quickly as possible. So now I'd like to open the floor for any questions you have. I do have um, our transportation um, team here, as well as our team from um, the capital improvements to answer the, any questions from those two areas that um, I just spoke about. Are there questions by board members? Transportation? <clears throat> Former Rivera. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Um, so in regards to the Alpha route, when can we anticipate that system being up and running efficiently at this point? I think I'll have Rodney Stuffelbean uh, come to the podium and give the current information that we have regarding Alpha Route. Vice President Reyes, members of the board, to answer your question, we have made significant gains since last Monday. Um, we had a significant number of students that were not placed on a route. Um, part of Alpha Route's pro process in creating routes is it takes an algorithm, puts those routes together in the most efficient manner possible. If there's not a route that that would fit on it, then creates an overflow route. So we had not had the ability to go back in and change those students to a route that was existing until midway through last week. Um, at one point, we were up to about 649, 650 routes last week on those students that had opted in that we um, just recently were made aware of. And with that process, we've been able to get it back down today. We're at that 614 route number again. So we were able to take those individual standalone routes through the work with Alpha Route and his team and our routing team at the office we were able to incorporate them into existing routes and get that number back down so that every student that we were advised of and, and were made aware that wasn't on a route is now on a route and has that information. So if I can add a follow up to that, so when students are added to routes, how is that information then communicated to our drivers? Because a big part of what we've also been hearing, you know, especially with our contracted services, that they are not receiving route information and so I guess I wanna understand how, how the routing system is actually shared with our drivers. And then when we have updates like adding students manually, how is that then communicated as well? Yes, ma'am. Currently, um, we met with all of the contractors on Thursday to make sure that everybody had all the current information that they had required to run their routes. We met with them, all three of the van drivers, uh, the van contractors, as well as the, three yellow, the two yellow bus contractors went over their routes independently to make sure everybody was accounted for. Those routes are now set. They took, they started beginning today, running the new updated routes to make sure that they had the most current information to date. Um, and as far as the second question, can you repeat that again? So when students are manually entered, how is that being communicated? So if I enter a student tonight, how does that information then trickle down to our drivers or our contracted drivers? So right now, until the system is completely functional, um, one of the things that we have to do is set up the SFTP, which is a nightly upload between Infinite Campus and Alpha Route. John Hanlon, who is the developer of Alpha Route, and Greg Wisniewski is the person in charge of Infinite Campus. Those two teams have been working flawlessly trying to get everything communicated correctly back and forth, um, making sure that both pathways to Alpha and from Alpha are communicated correctly and it shows and reflects on Infinite Campus. Right now, what we do is, is 
until we have the tablets established in the, in the, uh, the buses. That information is done every day by a daily route sheet that we're printing off and giving to the drivers. We're hoping that the routes and the uh, ta tablets are up and running this week. Okay, and so we're, I, I understand we're hopeful. Is, is Do we have a, a solid idea as to when this, because you know, obviously giving sheets to right. drivers, they can't read and, and hold Correct. paper at the same time. So do we have you know a sense as to when we can actually expect this system to work, to work the way it's supposed to work? So yes, the two, goal, the, the two major goals that we had at about midweek and we're able to implement today is the Alpha School system, which is uh, going to be implemented tomorrow morning, and that'll allow the buildings to have access to be able to go in and see the routes, as well as our charter non-public friends to go in and see the routes and to be able to look up the information directly through Alpha Route. The second phase of that was called Alpha Calm, which is our communication port that we've been waiting on for a week. Okay. Um, and it is actually functional tonight, and we're using it for the first time. Okay. So with that being said, those are the two aspects that we want to be able to communicate it with. Our next goal is to get the tablet up and running. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, until you get all of the routes set, that information can't, until you have the nightly uploads, it won't be able to be pushed into the tablets. And that is, the goal is to have that completed by the next day or so to where they're communicating nightly. Okay, thank you for that. And as far as how do we, how are we communicating this to our parents and the families that are either waiting on the buses to arrive or the buses don't show up? Correct. Is this software also supposed to be able to communicate this information to parents? That is portion of the Alpha Calm. Okay. And it started tonight with a text, a phone call, or an email message to the parents that are registered within Infinite Campus and have now been uploaded into Alpha Routing. Okay. And then one last question um, in regards to that. So what is the procedure or protocol if a driver has a kid and they don't know the route? We've had some information where, you know, students have been in some of our contracted vehicles and they've had kids and they didn't know where to take them. Is there a phone call that's supposed to be made? I guess I just want to understand if they have kids that don't, that are not on their rosters, what is the procedure for our drivers in that case? So that driver would call their dispatch, and our dispatch through a communication port between our dispatch and their dispatch would work out the logistics for where that student needs to go, make the appropriate phone calls to get parents notified, and make the arrangements to either drop that student off or bring that student back, and we would take care of it from that point. Okay, thank you. And my final question is, in regards to our call center times, I, I know families have been, you know, we are finding ourselves in, in a two-hour range, from my understanding. What is our strategy to making sure that we're able to, to answer our families, especially those who are waiting for their kids to come home? Um, what, what is our strategy for that, and, and what do we plan to do moving forward? So we're, we're working, part of that will be a reduce in the number of calls that are coming in now because majority of what we're getting, we're getting about 3,000 calls a day. A lot of that is getting their information of what their bus stop time is, where's their bus stop location. So with Alpha Calm being updated and Alpha Schools and the information being updated into Infinite Campus, we're hoping that that's gonna reduce that call volume in there and that those times will go back to what they were last year and in a more reasonable manner and be able to answer those directly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pierce. Um, so for a second, I want us to go back and um, kind of think through um, how this process is working. So you indicated each time there are students that are added into the system, we have to do rerouting. Have we um, identified a potential date at which it is our last date of adding students? Or can we anticipate that students can be added to routes throughout the rest of the year? So um, I can take that one. In our district, the size and the moves in and out, we have to be able to add students all the time. Now, Ohio Revised Code says when a new student comes in, we have, what, 10 days to route that kid. And at our meeting last week, you know, that's just too long um, because we have attendance issues that we need to be mindful of with our students. So. I know that um, Mr. Hanlon, the representative of the company, is working with our team, so we will have that, I believe, that functionality uh, at some point in the near future because we have to have that. 
Okay, thank you for that. So the second question would then be, if it's a 10-day period that we have to add them, can we anticipate when a new student comes that we're adding them within one to five days? That would be the target, and I would say closer to the one day, which is why I would like to see us, you know, the, the issue I think is sometimes when you go for, you know, really high efficiency, it can, you know, degrade some of your customer service issues. So I think what we're doing is lowering that efficiency so we can make more changes. And then as we get our C legs with the software, we'll be able to increase that efficiency without sacrificing the service that we need to provide to our family. So as we're lowering efficiency and getting our C legs, is there a way that we can communicate to our families that they can anticipate routing changes throughout the year and sometimes those changes will happen within a one to five day span. That's the expectation, yes. I think it's important for us to provide that information because then my second question leads to, if you're a parent and the information is on Infinite Campus but you don't have access to technology or you forget your Infinite Campus login, you're dependent upon parents, one, to log in to get this information or to pick up their phone for that call, correct? Am I, am I understanding that? Yes. Okay. Is there any way that we could also send the information home via the students through a letter in their backpack or a letter in, that they can get during homeroom? So if you give me a second here, I can explain. Part of AlphaCom will be anytime that there's an update or a change to a student's route, they're automatically going to be communicated that way. And we can send them the text message, email, or the phone call letting them know that you're, there's been a new student added, your bus stop has been changed by five minutes, and it'll go back five minutes or ahead five minutes. And we can communicate that as many times as we need to. So here's my question again. Mm -hmm. In addition to a text message, a mm -hmm. phone call, and placing it on Infinite Campus, is it possible that we can send a letter home with the child that can be handed directly to the parent? The child can even read it in some instances. Correct. Um, I would have to look into that. I, I don't see why we can entertain some of that. We can. In, in a former district, uh, the opening school packet would be a paper packet. It would have that route information in it. Um, so what you're asking is when there are changes, can that be mailed home? That can be done. I didn't say mail. Can it be handed to the child when the child comes to school? directly delivered to them. Could the child get computer time, log into your Infinite Campus portal if the students are able to, and they could print it out themselves in the computer lab? Absolutely. Or a low-tech method think, is just do a batch file and have them print it every day and hand it out at the build. If there's a, a routing yes. change, that is a batch routing Absolutely. change. Absolutely. And we think outside the box. The secretaries at the buildings, we've asked for three people to be identified as being able to have access to that the Alpha School and they will have the same features to be able to print a student's route out, any changes, um, and we can include them in the, the notifications for any changes that would come forward, and they could automatically print them out and probably hand them right out then. I'm excited. Thank you for thinking out of the box. We appreciate this. Mm -hmm. um, final question then relates to our students are often arriving to school late which means that they're missing critical morning announcements, the first period. Um, so my question is, what are we doing in our buildings to ensure that those students that are arriving late by bus are getting those announcements, the interventions that they need? Um, secondly, we have students who are altogether missing school because of transportation issues. What are we doing to advocate that those missed days do not count against them for truancy and that they are also getting the academic support and interventions that they need. So to the first question, so the students, I know in the high schools, I don't know, Dr. Chapman, if you know anything specifically that's happened in our elementary schools, when students, you can come up please, if students arrive in late, but I know in the high school they have an opportunity to get that information um, via the counselors or in the office. Now, I'm not sure what happens in our elementary and our middle schools. So, um, so Dr. certainly Chapman. when our students um, arrive late to school, um, there's a special code that the school administrators enter 
for attendance so that they know the reason for why the student is arriving late. If it's a late bus, there's a special code that we have district-wide. We would enter and then the teachers are able to provide them with any missed information that they miss. But I just wanna be clear, we can't make up that instructional time when our students are late, regardless of the reason, whether they are absent um, because of the missed bus or forever, whatever the reason is. The instructional time is a commodity that we can't get back. So we certainly wanna encourage our students and our families to um, attendance matters, attendance counts. We want them to be in school every day and on time. One additional question. Um, are students that arrive late, um, in some instances, I've also heard that they're not getting breakfast. Is there any way that we can, in all of our buildings, set aside an extra muffin or something so these students can also get breakfast? Absolutely. So the students, um, the breakfast is accounted for, so they have it there for them. And in most schools, when they set that aside, they know that they have a late bus. And they, they welcome the students from that late bus <laughs> into the, um, the building, and they make arrangements for them to have maybe a grab-and-go breakfast. So they might not sit in the cafeteria. They may take their breakfast with them to class. I'm just concerned that they're missing valuable instruction time. I and share I, your and concern. I appreciate yep. you for yes. bringing that to the table, Dr. Chapman. Mm -hmm. Board Member Becker Lee. Um, I, I'm going to go back to transportation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I guess sort of the threshold question is, despite these hiccups, it still sounds like this alpha software is pretty powerful. Yes, ma'am. And we're excited about using it. Yes, ma'am. So some of this is just when big systems collide and, you know, and beginning of the year. And so to, to put it in terms that's a little simpler, they're basically building this system for our oh, for transportation. Us. So um, they have some other transportation contracts. The complexity of our district, along with our um, Ohio guidelines and rules, are, no, are not like other districts in other states. So in, in Ohio, for us, there's some complexities there that needed to be built into it that, that were not part of the algorithm process. If, if you just take all of the road bumps out of the way and you just let the algorithm do the routing, it works perfectly. Okay. But then we have constraints that we have to put on it that goes against the algorithm. And, and to make sure that we don't have unsafe areas or unsafe roads that the buses are going down and students, the roads that we can't go down period because of a railroad crossing or something of that nature, or it's a four lane road with a center divide and we don't want a student going, crossing over that. So those are the constraints that's kind of put a handcuff on some of the algorithm that we really didn't identify until about late June, early July. So, but, but overall, it sounds like this is still, at the end of the day, once we get it up and running, this is going to make our communication and our, I mean, our transportation life much um, more streamlined and much the communication piece even more efficient. Yes. So, um, I mean, that's good to know. Like, we're not concerned that maybe this isn't the right system or the right mode. We're just got to work through these problems. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, the next question, and, and this is frust a frustration that I just feel like I need to raise, and, and, and it, it kind of ties back to um, our, our, our need to, th something Dr. Dixon said that's unforeseen. Now, some of this stuff is unforeseen. Every year we have the same problem with our comms communications being flooded by people who don't know, parents who don't know where their children are. And I guess it seems to me at some point, and, and I even thought, you know, when we did the readiness report, audit report, some of that would flesh out some of this. Be prepared. We're going to be, you know, and we still only have 10 people answering calls. Like, and, and, and it's the systems problem that we talk about all the time. And, 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 and I, I guess I'm trying to think about how do we see it coming <laughs> so we adjust for it. And, and I, I'm a little bit at a loss. I mean, it's more of a... Let's. Keep, I mean, and it's not 
just this situation. I mean, this happens repeatedly in other contexts and across our organization. And we just need to think about anticipating that. And, and, and this particular one is of concern for me because the thought of parents not knowing where their children are. And, you know, and that's before some of the other, you know, things that we've gotten emails about with special education children. And um, we don't want to be in the transportation business, but we're in it. And we have to, a minimum, be able to communicate and communicate more than waiting, having people wait two hours on the phone. And, and it ties back to, and, and it, I, I don't know if it's because, and we can't ask your organization to do it alone, right? Like, so there should have been some sort of a system trigger that said, okay, for the first two weeks of school, we have to have, I don't know if you hire temps or you bring people from other places, but we should have anticipated this. And um, we have to think as a system that way. And, and, um, and I hope in the next few weeks, while this is still sort of in the, we're working through it, we figure out a way to get those call times down. We figure out a way to let parents know where their children are. And I assume we can if we could just answer the calls more quickly. Because we do know, we have the software now that tells us where the buses are. Yes, ma'am. All right, so I, I guess that's my request, is that we, we think quickly and systemically in the next few weeks. Um, and then um, the other thing, uh, and, and, and maybe, the, maybe this is a more specific request. Can we, we're hearing just generally, I mean, like you said, you have around 3,000 calls. I'd like to see over the course of the next few board meetings, or even just in a report, it doesn't need to be at a board meeting. How are those numbers going down? Like, let's track it, okay? So that we can satisfy ourselves that we're solving this problem. Vice President Reyes. Hello. Hi. Uh, I actually have seen the bus system uh, at work when there was a child that was put on the bus, the wrong bus. And I, it actually wasn't our, our school district, but uh, they put it on the wrong bus. They realized they were, the child was on the bus and how the uh, bus driver communicated, stayed with the child till the parents could get to them. So uh, kudos to, uh, to the group uh, for that. And uh, the people in my neighborhood said the buses are doing a lot better than they were doing last year. So, so, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of good things going on over there, but still with the opportunities. My question is actually with AC. So, <laughs> I'll step aside. <laughs> so I don't know if um, Alex wants to answer this or if, if uh, yeah, we can Dr. have James Alex can. come up and answer those questions. It's a big one, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, so, I saw the list, and we've seen the list of the uh, projects going on. One of the questions that um, some of our families are asking is, are all the rooms being air conditioner, i.e., I know that some of our buildings that are already done, perhaps the gym's not air conditioned yet. Uh, perhaps there's a, a larger area that's not air conditioned. Uh, when and how will we, will we be able to communicate that? Uh, how will we as a board be able to see uh, our progress um, in addressing those non-air conditioned areas, perhaps from Phase one, phase two, phase three. Sure, uh, President Adair to uh, Vice President Reyes. Great question. So this year's work is a little bit different than it's been in previous years. Um, just making sure I'm going to say this accurately. I believe all spaces and all buildings getting HVAC updates this summer is comprehensive. So in previous years, we had some auditoriums and gymnasiums that did not receive air conditioning. They received ventilation and heating upgrades, but not necessarily that addition of air conditioning. I don't believe there are any exceptions this year. Um, so we, we kind of were more aggressive with scope and made sure we were tackling all areas. Now, having said that, with the, the update that you saw, there are still some spaces in some of those buildings that do not have that air conditioning at, at this moment. Um, and we can certainly keep updating that in real time as superintendent's bringing her updates here. Obviously, buildings are going to know those uh, changes as they're kind of happening, especially if the temperatures warm up. Um, we've uh, been blessed with cooler weather, so uh, maybe not quite as much notice in the building on some of those spaces that don't have their air conditioning. Um, did I... I feel like I'm leaving off one answer, maybe. Uh, kind of. So, I, uh, will we receive a schedule of those other areas that weren't air conditioned in the previous phases? So, 
So there's a high school that doesn't have Northland, Northland doesn't have AC in the in their gym. Do we know when they're going to get that? There's other or um, buildings that don't have, to your point, auditorium or gymnasium AC. Do we will we be getting a list and or a calendar of when those will be done? Definitely a work in progress. So I think we have a good inventory of those spaces right now that do not have that air conditioning, and then we'll need to start working through prioritizing those projects. My guess is we'll look at things like proximity. So you know, one thing we know is um, when you're managing this work, it is not super efficient to have contractors running all across town. So we'll probably look for some efficiencies in terms of the type of systems we put in, um, some regional proximity to try to cluster projects together. But uh, I, de I definitely don't have that answer for you right now, but something we're working towards. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so we visited a couple of schools at the beginning of the year, um, and there were big machines outside their buildings. Um, can we increase the parameter of safety? I was just, I was able to get pretty close, um, and I have a curiosity. I can just imagine a child that has the same curiosity. So can um, can we expand the parameters of that safety? I'm just concerned that one of our children. Uh, we'll, we'll wander, yeah, we'll wander. Simple answer is absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I will certainly take any uh, specific examples you can, you can give me. Like I'm, I'm pretty comfortable, confident that our equipment is typically going to have its own self-containment around it. So, you know, we're always concerned about uh, employee safety as well as student safety. So I think all equipment's going to have some kind of enclosure that there's not a safety risk, but obviously we don't like kids around equipment. Um, it's, it's not good for the kids or the equipment, frankly. So keeping uh, both little hands as well as uh, leaves and garbage wrappers, right. Uh, ideally, we, we keep those things as far apart as we can. But if you've got any specific examples you can share, that'd be great. And Alex, when we are, um, thank you. And then uh, uh, the last question. So um, as we pass some of our buildings that are still uh, under construction, basically, uh, of AC, how are we communicating to our parents that that is occurring? Um, so I'll give you an example. I pass by a school, a middle school every day. Uh, our construction workers are doing what they need. The flags are there. Uh, parents sometimes don't adhere to the flags um, where they're at. And it, might have, it, it may be that they don't know that there's a big construction um, project going on because they're, they're busy going to work. Um, how are we communicating to our families that their particular school where their child is uh, is under construction for the array of um, changes? Yeah, another great question. So I'll tell you what should be happening, and then certainly I'll take any feedback about any concerns that we need to uh, circle back to. So we're working closely with each building administrator. You know, so we, we, we know we're disruptive when we're continuing this work into the school year, not ideal, uh, but making sure we're working through them with their pickup drop-off uh, procedures. Ideally, there should be very little to no work happening during the school day. So it sounds like you must you uh -huh. must be seeing something that's uh, outside of that. And there, there may be a good reason for why that's happening, too. Uh, but those are definitely things that we coordinate with the building administrator. And then we're oftentimes leaning pretty hard on that building administrator because he or she's going to have that best contact with the parents. And I can only assume something's happening when I see somebody on the roof, so, uh, some bodies, a couple of bodies up on the roof. Uh, I can't say that I because I'm driving by, so I can't say that I've stopped and seen if they're actually putting on an AC unit, or, but I am seeing them walking on the roofs where their flags are at, and then I'm seeing parents coming uh, directly near that particular building where I'm seeing people on roofs. So I don't know what exactly is going on, but I can definitely get that information to you. Yeah, it would be helpful. Like I, I, I know we're not going to get into specifics here, but right. like in general, once school's in session, we try to really limit any work that's disruptive. And it kind of depends on the building, whether you can have employees on a roof and whether you can hear it inside or not. And then obviously, we're always looking at the um, significance of the work. So if we know we've got an active roof leak, we're going to do whatever it takes to keep the interior of those spaces a uh, good learning environment. So we'll, we'll make exceptions to even our own rules when it makes sense. Thank you. Of course. You're welcome. Um, Alex, before you leave, and I'm going to come back to you, but I have a question for Alex about air conditioning while he's standing here. So kind of off of Ramona's question, um, as you know, we've made uh, some contract, some uh, commitments in, a, in our contract with our teachers. 
Um, and we have made commitments to have climate control I mean, all the learning uh, spaces for children as well as the teacher uh, workspaces. Um, so I think maybe that's where Ramona was maybe headed in terms of, uh, you know, how are we going to plan that out? How are we going to make sure we're demonstrating that commitment um, and, uh, you know, showing that we're making progress on that? I just want to say just a little bit clearer to tie back in, I think, where Ramona was going. Yeah, so great question, President Adair. So like I said, just I'm going to be very clear. So I, if I'm confident that we've got what we would call traditional classrooms, and I know we'll frequently get, you know, so gymnasium is a classroom, to totally get it. Auditoriums are classrooms. Um, so if I'm comfortable saying that traditional classrooms will be covered, um, certainly with the contract that you'll see this evening for the Hubbard and Cause facilities, where I know we still have those gaps, are going to be those kind of specialty classrooms, auditoriums, gymnasiums. So right now, um, we, have a, we have a spreadsheet that we use to track um, status of HVAC work across the district. So we're sending out teams right now to kind of verify, make sure we've got, you know, something is super clear on paper. We want to make sure we're absolutely certain we know where those gaps are. And then we'll be working on a multi-year plan for how we can roll out the rest of that work. Thank you. For Alex, can we, once you've done that verification when you've gone out and looked and made triple sure that your spreadsheet is correct. Can we have a dashboard on our website that just shows how we're going? And, and I'm sorry, do we have one already? We have something that's kind of like it, you know. The operation system. The operation system. Fix it. We, kind of. Yeah, it technically, there's no reason why we could not. Yep. Yep. And, and, and Far simpler compared to what we've done so far, honestly. Yep. And so let's, let's, Somebody put a pin in that and let's revisit that and or come back and tell us when it's up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Deal. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And that's all I had for you. Great. Uh, Board Member Vera had one more. Do you, oh. For Alex or for transportation? Well, now I have one for Alex. Oh. <laughs> I didn't before. <laughs> but um, really quickly, as we're obviously very focused on AC because it's hot right now and we have some, you know, as uh, President Adair mentioned, some commitments we want to make sure we deliver on. Are we already thinking about heat in terms of do we know, are we thinking about our, what buildings we need to be monitoring more closely? I guess I want to kind of get ahead of what the process will look like as we begin to enter those winter months. Yeah, uh, Board Member Vera, great question, right? So I, I would say for our entire operations team, we're always looking ahead. So right, the immediate need is the air conditioning, but our, our teams and certainly the, the maintenance team uh, full speed ahead on making sure that the heating systems are ready to go because it's right around the corner for us. So absolutely. Okay. And that's all I have for you, Alex. Thank you so much. <laughs> and just really quickly for um, in regards to the alpha communication piece, um, I, I, you know, I want to make sure even with the emails, phone calls, and text messages, as intentional as we are on our website and things to make sure that things are, communication is given in multiple languages, what does that look like as it relates to the alpha communication? Are parents getting text messages in the language settings that they have clicked through Infinite Campus? I will have to check on that because I'm not 100% certain on that. That's not been a question that we've been focused on, okay. but I will definitely change our priority and we'll, we'll find out an answer for that. Yeah, and I think that would That's just very be important. It's, it's yeah, because we have a lot of families that you know our kids that are ELL just entering our district. They don't speak English, and I know last year that was a concern. We had kids getting on buses; they didn't know where they were supposed to get off at. Families didn't know where to pick them up at. So I do want to be mindful that this system that is supposed to be our tool for communication is, in fact, you know, thinking about all of our families. So thank you. Yes, Dr. Pierce. So my piggyback to that is the letter that's sent home with the students, can we make sure that it is translated into the family's language? Thank you. Okay, I just have one quick It'll be really quick. I okay, well, last question. Okay, it, Rebecca it's not a question. It, it's, it's a positive because I wanted to share just one little thing. I mean, Ramona reminded me that it's, uh, the board member Ray's reminded me that um, for all of everything else, there's a lot of really good going out there. And I just on out there and I just happened to witness um, 
a kindergartner getting on the bus for the first time in a neighborhood where my grandson lives, and I was, we were standing, and we, we had to wait for the bus to go by, so we watched this whole scene, and it was just beautiful. There's a family there, there's neighbors there, everybody's taking pictures, the bus driver's smiling from ear to ear, she's strapping the child in for the first time, and it was all joy. And I just want to acknowledge that that's happening, too, amidst all of this other stuff, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, one more, sorry. Okay. So we talked about bus drivers, but do we have enough aides on buses? It's more of an HR question, or do you have that? Okay. We are always needing more aides. Okay. Um, right now, I know, I do believe we have the adequate numbers. Um, I can double check that. Um, but I have not had an instance where we've been short an aid at, that I am aware of at this time. Okay, thank you. And, and the President there, um, I do know that a lot of our parents communicate through the aid for late buses, early buses, change your routes. Yes. So, um, you know, I'm, I know we're talking about those communications, but I've seen where the, because uh, I have about five kids that get picked up in my neighborhood, where the aid is texting the mom that they're going to be late, where the bus driver in their stop is texting a mom, they're going to be late, or they're going to – usually it's not early. <laughs> they're going to be uh, late. Um, so I've that's another method where I've seen people uh, uh, communicate. And I thought that um, it worked really well with the um, Chromebook distribution when we were out there. Um, there was a lot of communication. And the, actually, one of the um, parent engagement ambassadors actually asked if they could walk our parents through the uh, parent portal. Uh, so that that's, you know, we talk about how you can get communication. Uh, so it was, it was really nice to see that other members of our staff are really paying attention to, hey, I saw that all our parents were asking them to pull up the student information. We need to make sure not only the parents that were in line for their Chromebooks know that, that everybody knows that. So I, I see it in our schools where uh, some of our other staff is taking into account all these, trying to help us with some of these uh, uh, pitfalls. Like, I don't know what other way to say that, uh, to make sure that our parents are informed through the parent portal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go back to Dr. Dixon okay. for a report uh, on our new report card and goal and success. Yep. Indicators. Thank you, Board President Dea. So for the final um, part of my report tonight, I would like to handle, hand it over to our Chief Performance Officer, Dr. Russell Brown, who will provide an update on our academic performance data, the state report card changes, and the alignment between our out outcomes and the board goals. So, Dr. Brown. Good evening, Board President Adair, Vice President Reyes, uh, Superintendent Dixon, members of the board and community, pleased to join you this evening and have an opportunity to, uh, again, discuss what we can anticipate uh, with the new state report card and the relationship between our board goals, um, interim goals, and the state report card. So again, purpose today, um, really just want to give folks an opportunity to understand what the report card is going to look like. Uh, again, the connection between the, our performance on, on uh, our goals and the relationship to those external measures and the interim goals and how they play with those as well. And then uh, also to talk about how our students performed last year on a variety of measures and how, again, this uh, funnels up to the report card in the end. So the report card that's going to be um, released in, in mid-September of this year, I think it's September 15th is, is the expected date, will have five components on it that are, are going to be released. There will not be an overall rating released this year. The five components that you see up there are achievement, progress, gap closing, grad rate, and early literacy. And we'll take some time to go through each of these. Uh, I'm just going to apologize on the front end. This is sort of lengthy. We probably could spend an hour on each of these components if we really wanted to get in the weeds. So it's a relatively high level, but, but still, given the breadth, it, it will take a, take a minute to do. So my apologies on that. So again, uh, the five components each will receive a rating uh, of one to five stars. Again, there will not be an overall rating uh, for the system or any school this year. That comes next year. And again, want to show where our board goals align to this um, and different uh, actions within the board goals and interims align to different components here. Uh, and oftentimes the board goals will align to multiple components in this. And then based on what we've seen in the past in Ohio, and again, 
this is Ohio's report card, so it's limited to Ohio, and the comparisons that can be made are limited to Ohio. Uh, how do we compare to other urban districts? How are we compared historically to other urban districts? Where do we think we're going to land this year based on the data that we have? And now I want to call back to uh, a little bit of information we talked about last year, right about this time. Matter of fact, maybe around September. And talking about, again, the board had established goals at the point, and then we talked about interim goals. And again, our goals, if, if you look at them, they start with uh, strengthening reading proficiency and they ladder up. And then we talk about closing opportunity gaps, which is really, again, closing that graduation gap, which sets the stage then to talk about portrait ready graduates. Those students who really are prepared to go out in the world and have something that sort of that gift with purchase beyond, beyond graduation. And again, as a series of steps towards that portrait, each student in school should see themselves in that. Uh, you know, changes need to occur at all school levels, so in the elementary setting, in the middle school setting, and in the high school uh, setting. And the interim goals are what we sort of keep track of during the course of the year to know whether or not we're on track. And um, it's not only just within year, it also tells us about where we're going to go next year. So our interim goals for kindergarten are really telling us where we're going to be three years later with third graders. And the same thing when we're looking at high school. When we look at on-track rates with ninth grade, we're talking about where kids are going to be four years later. So it's not just within year, but it's across as well. And again, uh, all of this is anchored in a, a database continuous improvement cycle. And I want to remind you all that, that, again, we adopted these goals in the interims in November of last year. So we've been doing this for a little bit less than half a year. And, and, you know, so we're talking about mainly about a semester of it being embedded in the schools and starting to work through this process in our schools. So it's very young for our system as a whole. And again, each year, again, this supports a continuous improvement cycle. It's going to support school improvement planning. It supported school improvement planning last year. You'll hear me sort of echo that. And again, every time we start to see success, we're going to consolidate upon that and we're going to build upon it to move forward. And then we'll make adjustments based on data as we move through. So let's start with strengthening reading proficiency. It is probably the clearest of the board goals as far as connecting to a variety of different things on the report card. And I sort of want to walk through uh, bits and pieces of this along the way. The most obvious connection is early literacy. You know, the, the, the board goals for third grade, all the interims talk about kindergarten, first, second grade, all that laddering up to third grade. So early literacy is, is sort of an obvious connection to that third grade goal. Again, this one hasn't been rated since 2018, 2019. Uh, again, the board goal aligns beautifully to this in a couple different ways. And there are three different things that weigh into this. And they're all weighted. So how kids do on third grade, the board goal, comprises about 40% of this. How many kids get matriculated into fourth grade? Another 35. So 75% of, of this component is comprised by those two things. The re remaining 25% lines up to our interim goals. What happens as kids go from kindergarten to first grade, first grade to second grade, and second grade to third grade? By its very nature, this, like graduation, has to lag a year. So the data that we're going to see on the report card for this year is what happened when kids came into school last year. So as they move from kindergarten to first grade last year, at the start of last year, they went into first grade. The kids who had been in first grade the year before who came into second grade, well, if we think back to time, what kids are we talking about there? We're talking about pandemic. So we can expect that 25% to be suppressed because it was all tied to the pandemic. The work that happened this year will show up on next year's report card. So I want to lean in and talk a little bit more about that. So because that is suppressed, we can expect that not to, that 25% not to be showing up on this report card very, in a very flattering way for us. Historically, the large urbans, the ones that look like us, that is, uh, they have high, uh, well, A, they're relatively large. Uh, the number of students who qualify for free or reduced price lunch is at or approaches 100%. And they have high levels of diversity uh, in terms of special ed, second language learners, and in terms of uh, students of color as well. Uh, historically, we've sort of been in the middle of that pack. In 2017, 2018 data, 2018, 2019 data, uh, schools in, or systems in this group scored two to would have scored the equivalent of two to three stars. And again, 
because there's a lag, we're not going to see the work we did last year until next year. We expect an outcome this year to be one or two stars on this particular measure, again, suppressed by, by the fact that we were talking about pandemic learning. That being said, let's talk about what happened this year, what we're going to see on next year's report card. I felt that way too sometimes. Mm -hmm. So again, just to remind everybody about the interim goals, kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Our goals were intentionally structured, and I really appreciate the, uh, the board's foresight in this, to account for two things. One, how many students are operating at grade level? But we know that we have a substantial number of kids who are not operating at grade level. And in some cases, it's two or three grade levels below. Well, that type of, of movement doesn't happen in one year. You don't go from two years below grade level to at grade level en masse in one year. So we had to incentivize growth. And the, and the board goals are structured in a way to incentivize growth. Because if we grow kids, and, and by growth, I'm talking about stretch growth. Annual typical growth, you know, if I come in two years behind and I make annual typical growth, I leave two years behind. We're not talking about that. We're talking about stretch growth. Stretch growth by its very nature is someplace between one and a half to almost two years worth of growth. So if we get closer to those stretch growth targets, it's like an investment. We've gotten kids closer to where they need to be. And if you do that as a sustained process over time, we close gaps and more and more kids move to proficiency. It's literally impossible to move to proficiency without growth, and the growth is our leading indicator. So again, we have a ladder of those goals going up uh, to third grade to prepare our students to be able to meet that third grade target. So this year, what do we see? We saw a solid change in, in uh, the number of students who are scoring at grade level in third grade going from the fall, which is orange here, to the spring, which is green. If you look at first and second grade, you see that there are solid movements again from the start of the year in orange to the end of year in green. Third grade's flat. So um, when we look at that, well, my question is, well, that's nice. We saw a lot of change in proficiency, change in the, the, the rate of kids reading at grade level in the early grades. But how did that compare to before? What did it look like in 18, 19, pre-pandemic? So uh, we see that when we look pre-pandemic, uh, in 18, 19, kindergartners actually showed greater gains in proficiency. We had a larger number of students who were closer to proficiency and crossed that threshold. By second grade, you see that we were at parity with where we were in 2018, 2019. Third grade, back in 18, 19, some kids actually slid below the proficiency threshold. And this year, we held our own. But again, that's only half the story. And again, when we look at third grade, about two out of three kids were below grade level when we started. So the question then becomes, how much did we grow? So when we looked at the mid-year data, when we received that mid-year data, and thank you, Dr. Pierce, for pointing out a very awkward wording, uh, we did begin to see some movement and growth. And by the end of the year, we see positive growth. Kindergarten actually outgrew more students showed stretch growth than they did in the 18-19 year. First grade, not so much. We lost a little ground there in terms of growth. Second grade, again, a little bit of a bump in terms of growth. Third grade, we saw tremendous growth. Not all those kids crossed the threshold for proficiency, but they grew exceptionally. That sets them up when they go into fourth grade. They're better prepared. It's like money in the bank. It gets them closer to where they need to be. This question has come up time and time again. I think, uh, Ms. Beckerley, you have brought this up more than once. You know, what's the correlation? How confident can we be that the iReady actually tells us something about what's going to happen on the OST? Well, when we looked at the correlations for this for third, fourth, and fifth grade, we saw correlations that ran between 0.8 and 0.830. Now, for, for those of you, it's been a minute since you've been in statistics. A perfect correlation is one. And for somebody that used to do test development, if I was looking to develop an alternate form for a test, if I could hit 0.7, I was really happy. 0.8 is very strong. And you see the predictive proficiency rates down there. You want to keep those tucked in the back of your mind. Okay? So 32% for third grade, 35% for fourth grade, 
and 35% for fifth grade. Here's our data. So this is the OST data, the OST data that's going to inform our report card. It's close to what I actually expect to see uh, as part of the performance index calculation for our report card. The gains in third and fourth grade were impressive, double-digit gains in proficiency. We literally cut the gap that was created by the pandemic in half. And just for some context here, I want to throw in a quote here. In the spring of last year, a national assessment of educational progress was given to, to students across the country. It is the gold standard to know about what's going on. It, it creates what's called the nation's report card. And I'm going to quote uh, the Associate Commission Commissioner, Daniel McGrath. These are some of the largest declines we've observed in a single assessment cycle in 50 years, uh, you know, since the start of NAEP. And the, the drops that they saw were really profound in math. And the drops in math and reading were disproportionately borne by black and brown kids and disproportionately borne by kids who were scoring in the lower parts of proficiency to begin with. So the idea that last year that we cut that gap in half in third and fourth grade is impressive. I don't recall many times in my career where I've seen double digit gains in reading or math <laughs> for that matter. And so I thought those were rather, rather impressive uh, to go with. Again, sixth grade was near pan, uh, parity with uh, pre-pandemic. So those scores are, um, our proficiency rate for sixth grade is almost equal to what it was before. And again, fifth and seventh grades were, were sort of flat on that. Uh, mind you that our participation rates in these grade levels were very representative, well over 95% for this. So we have a very representative group of scores, and there's no reason to think the scores were, were impacted by participation in any way, shape, or form. So let's talk about those predictions. So 32% is what was predicted for third grade. We ended up at 33.1. Yeah, predicted 35, ended up 36.8. Again, third grade had exceptional growth. Fourth grade had good growth as well. Fifth grade hit on par. Again, what we see is a very solid predictor for grades three through five. And we're looking forward to having additional data for grades six through eight. Six through eight last year uh, was the first time that iReady was used. Um, we introduced it mid-year and um, Actually, I'm misspeaking there. It was introduced mid-year. We did not have a, a, the level of, of participation in the mid-year assessment for me to be comfortable to build those relationships. I expect to have that data this year. And again, spoiler alert, our goal for this year, the board goal, uh, was 29.4%. We hit 33.1%. So we exceeded our board goal. So we're pretty happy about that. And again, I think it speaks to the hard work of our teachers in our schools and the focus on early literacy to get that work done and the focus on growth. Uh, I think it's really imperative that we continue that focus as we move forward. Switching to math. I'm building up now to the next indicator. You see the math scores here. Again, fairly solid improvements in third and fourth grade again. And then again, weaker middle school results. But the gains are a little bit behind what we saw in reading. Again, mirrors the national dialogue for math. There's nothing about this that <coughs> stands out from the national dialogue around proficiency at this point. Again, very strong prediction. Uh, not surprisingly to me, the, the math predictions are actually a little stronger than the reading. Um, when I see these types of correlations, it warms my heart because I know we can build solid models over time. And realistically, last year in my head is our new baseline. As we're emerging from pandemic, we're back to in-person instruction, we're starting to have a stable environment from which we can build solid models as we move forward, we've got the right tools to do it. When I see uh, correlations like this, I know we have the right tools to be able to monitor our student achievement and be able to report to the board and the community whether or not we're making the gains that we intend and having the data we need to be able to adjust our strategies as we move forward. And again, you see the predicted proficiency rates below. And you're going to see when we actually look at, at where we landed, a little bit of a gap in third grade. Why? We didn't see the growth in third grade math that we saw in third grade reading. In, or, in order to hit those targets, you have to at least meet typical growth. And if you exceed it, you're going to exceed the target. If you fall below, then you're going to fall below. 
So again, we need to have an acceleration of growth in the lower grades across the board because it sets the foundation for learning as kids move forward. All of the above wraps up into something called the performance index. It's the second component on the report card. And this is one that's been around for a while. And that we've had a performance index for a while. And it, it's actually, to me, it's the best overall barometer for a system because it counts for every assessment we give. It's not just reading and math. It's reading, math, science. It's everything, including end-of-course assessments. As performance improves, I don't care where you are on, the, on that spectrum. You could be a, a student who's performing at the lowest performance level of, of achievement. As you move from limited to basic, there, it impacts the index. On the other hand, if I'm a gifted kid and I go from advanced to advanced plus, it impacts the, the index. This was designed to incentivize growth at all levels for each and every student. So what do we expect to see on this? Well, let's look back to the past a little bit. Stars are awarded on the basis of the percent of points earned. So it's, it used to be that we just looked at the performance index and we had assigned stars on that. Now we're changing it to a percent of points earned, so it looks more like a typical grade in that regard. Historically, Columbus is sort of in the middle. If you look at this, you see that, you know, with a, you know, 20, uh, 18, 19, we had a 52.6% uh, points earned. That puts us in the middle. Uh, last year, with a 379 uh, again, pretty much in the middle of the large urban districts in the state. I'm now going to put the thresholds on for stars. So systems that have a PI score that's below, or percent of points earned that's below 50 are going to get one star. Systems that have a, a PI percent of points earned that falls between 50 and 7, 70 are going to get two stars. Above 70, you get three, and then as you go on up, it, there are different, different breaks. So in 1819, all of the systems here would have received two stars. Last year, every one of these systems, us included, would have received one. This year, we expect someplace between one and two stars. I think we'll be real close to that threshold, and we might squeeze out a second star on that. But again, significant movement. And as we move upward on this, again, improving achievement for all students, we can anticipate over time growing towards that third star mark. The third indicator is the progress indicator. And this is entirely about growth. Now, this is growth as measured in grades four through eight and on up into the end of course assessments. Again, third grade acts as the baseline for this growth calculation. And then we uh, look at, you know, how do kids do as they move to fourth grade? Did they make growth? It's across years, not within. So we're looking at changes across years. Again, when you're doing this type of calculation, particularly across years, there are certain things that make it work better. One of which is to have a stable environment. Second of which is to have stable assessments. We haven't had those for a minute, so I think this is going to be a little bit more volatile than it has been in the past. But again, our focus on growth aligns very well to this, and we can expect that as, as we move forward, if we continue to make stretch growth, we will see it show up on this. Again, this hasn't been rated since 1819. Again, the rating method has changed. I, I expect the change that occurred with the rating method will have minimal impact uh, for how this works for us. We're a large system. And so small differences are likely to be interpreted just by the way this is calculated. The larger systems across the state have received the equivalent of one star in this. Uh, we've been in the mix on this as well. This data will actually not show up in September. It'll show up in October. It, it, the data comes later. It's just not available. And again, I expect historically one maybe two stars. The methodology, the way they've changed the methodology might favor us going to two stars, but uh, again, a little trepidatious on that for the time being. Want to see, see how that stabilizes over time. Again, moving on to the next and the last uh, one of the components that I think is most connected to the third grade, though also uh, high school graduation definitely weaves into this. Gap closing is the fourth fourth component I'm going to talk about today. 
and I'm impressed. Not everybody's glassed over yet. This is a lot. <laughs> um, this is based on meeting state annual measurable achievement objectives uh, for six measures, reading, math, English learner improvement, which is English language acquisition, gifted student performance, chronic absenteeism, and graduation. These targets are set at the state level and are the same for every system around the state. They're set at the state level and they're meant to move the state system. That being said, if they're set to the state averages and we're significantly below the state averages, these are harder for us to hit. They're not, some of these, what you should be hearing here over time is some of these thresholds that are, that are set around the star ratings are not sensitive to where we are. They're set way higher than, than where we are in terms of performance and it will take years to get to a place where we actually move them. Again, prior years we've performed comparably to other uh, large urbans here. I actually think we're going to turn out okay on this one. I think we're going to see someplace between two to three stars and this is going to be driven primarily by our work with English language learners, work around chronic absenteeism, and graduation. Again, we see that investment over time uh, in, in those areas and it pays, pays off on this one. Moving forward, we achieved our third grade goal uh, for the system, the board goal, uh, really based on exceptional growth. The, the fact that we saw exceptional growth in third grade, double digit movement and achievement, it's fantastic. Again, really think uh, our students and our teachers should be very proud of the work they did. That's hard work uh, to have accomplished. Achievement builds over time, as I mentioned before. Again, the work that's done in the lower grades pays off in the upper grades. That's true for English language arts and mathematics. And just want to start transition into high school thinking here because we're getting ready to talk about graduation rate. Well, what happens in middle school math sets up high school. So everything builds upward on that. And again, we just can't make improvements here unless we continue to focus on growth and incentivize growth and celebrate our schools and our students and our teachers when they achieve growth. That, you know, the, the proficiency model doesn't credit our teachers for the hard work that they've done. The growth model does. So again, moving on growth is going to impact all of these uh, things I've talked about, all of these components that I've mentioned. It's going to impact PI. It will impact early literacy, obviously. That's where, again, the third grade goal in particular lines up. Uh, we'll see it on progress out in progress, the value-added computations. Growth and value-added are essentially the same construct. One's within year the way we're doing it. The other's across years. And again, gap closing. We have one more thing to talk about here in a moment. Again, moving forward, we want to foster growth. For our students who are furthest behind, stretch growth is the most important for them. We want to see every student grow. Again, I don't care if a student's gifted. We wish to see growth. But for our students who are below, hitting stretch growth targets are an imperative. Again, what we saw this past year is iReady ended up being a very good predictor of this. Um, fairly new idea in terms of using it as a supplemental. We need to build fidelity in the use of that supplemental over time, and we need to invest and monitor that as we move forward. Again, learning depends on the learning environment. One of the things that we heard, and it, it came up again and again and again, was the need to focus on school climate and attendance. If kids are not present, you know, I, we had somebody lean in, Dr. Chapman a moment ago, leaned into the importance of you know, students coming to school every day on time. Instructional time is our most valuable commodity. We need our students to be with our teachers. We need focused uh, instructional time. So again, we need to work on school climate so students wish to be in buildings, and, and we need to uh, work on student attendance because we've seen such a strong relationship between student attendance and student achievement. Okay, we have one indicator left, <laughs> or one component left, and it, it lines up very well to uh, our graduation goal. And again, um, as the board recalls, the, the objective here was to have our students graduating at a rate of 86 percent uh, at the end of the 25-26 academic year, August of that year. The graduation component uh, is a little different than it used to be. It now weights both the four-year and the five-year graduation rates together. So the four-year graduation rate comprises 60 percent of this component and the five-year graduation rate uh, comprises the other 40 percent. I actually think that's good. That incentivizes us to continue to work with students and help them get across the stage. And you've already seen us 
you know, focus in on, well, summer graduation, winter graduation. Again, this idea, let's continue, let's invest, let's work with our students to get them across the stage. It's the best thing for our community to make sure that our students have a diploma, even if it takes them a little bit longer to do so. Again, compared to the other urbans, we have been very comparable over time here as well. Again, sort of like that early literacy component, what you're gonna see on this year's report card is what happened last year. So the 79.7% grad rate that we saw last year will be what's on the report card this year. And I'm sorry I don't have the fifth year number in my head right now, but those two will get weighted together, 60%, 40%. This is that historical data. So I took the historical data that existed for four-year and five-year graduation rates and weighted them accordingly. 60% for the four-year, 40% for the five-year, and this shows where systems around the state would have landed in the 18, 19, and 2021 20, school years. And you see, again, we're right in the middle of all the large urban systems. No large disparities there. Again, I'm gonna impose the thresholds on it. Gotta hit 84% to get a second star. We're aiming to be there in 24, 25. The board goal to hit that is in 24, 25, just for context. To hit a third star, you have to hit 90%. That's a very ambitious target, and that's gonna take a while to get to for us. And it's one that, actually with large systems, even really high-functioning large systems, to maintain a 90% graduation rate is hard. Uh, we have a lot of mobility, we have a lot of transition in and out. So when I, again, talked about where the star thresholds were set and their sensitivity or lack of sensitivity to where we are, this is one that's not very sensitive to where we are. We're not gonna see movement on this for a couple of years. So again, we expect one star on this one. So again, in terms of context of what happened this year, as we're leading up for that, as we're thinking forward, we have work to do. And again, what we looked at is on track rates. You know, what's happening, because again, grad rate doesn't happen in the senior year. Grad rate gets defined by a cohort that starts in ninth grade and you wanna not get off track. It's sort of like, a, you know, if I'm driving across, well, <laughs> uh, bear with me. I drove all the way from Portland to come here last year. I didn't wanna end up in Arizona on my way. I wanted to keep adjusting my path along the way and stay on a fairly straight line. If you wait too far, you get too far off track and it takes a lot to get, get back on. So it's really important to intervene early and get kids back on track as quickly as possible. And part of that's engagement keeping kids engaged. So again, middle school math matters. And we see that we had, again, our middle school math was, was a little weak compared to uh, the lower grades. This is the first year that we had a census for Algebra 1. I want to point this out because those Algebra 1 numbers are not really comparable. That first year there, 18, 19, oh, I think that was like 120 kids that took that test that year. So it's sort of apples to oranges. That's 13.4% uh, is our baseline at this point. This is comprehensive, it represents the entire population. And again, we need to improve our middle school math in order to be able to help those kids. That being said, when we were sitting down and doing school improvement planning last year, middle schools had to set math goals. So elementary schools are focused on reading, middle schools set goals around math, trying to lead up to this. So again, last year we came, we reported out to the board, you heard where we were mid-year in terms of the proportion of kids on track. Mid-year we were feeling pretty good about ninth grade. 10th and 11th grades were off track and substantially off track. By the end of the year, we lost ground with ninth grade. That didn't surprise me that much because honestly, as kids move forward, there's more opportunity for them to fall off track. We need again to build on this. Grade 11, on the other hand, did begin to close the gap. They saw a bit of an uptick there, which was good. <sighs> Again, with all this work, the fact that 11th graders are a little closer than wh where we uh, started at mid-year, they still have more gained uh, room, uh, room to gain in order to be able to hit the target in the 12th grade. Our, our schools this year are actually gonna have to work harder and be more focused as they uh, move towards the graduation target for this year. That is part of the work that, that they're aware of. Again, it's part of the work that we're gonna talk about with our high schools yet again, I think, 
Thursday this week. <laughs> okay, takeaways, and I'm rounding home, I promise. <laughs> uh, again, uh, high school graduation rates depend on improving um, on-track rates throughout uh, a student's entire high school uh, career. It's really, you know, if we think about closing gaps, if we really want to create the space for folks to be able to fulfill that, uh, that, that desire to have uh, students meet the, the criteria for a portrait graduate, you have to be on track. You have to have the space to be able to do that within your, within your calendar and within um, your schedule. If you're doing a lot of uh, makeup and recovery, it takes away from the time and space that you could use to be able to pursue things that would, would help expand your, your post-secondary readiness. Again, um, just like third grade uh, reading doesn't magically appear in third grade, it builds from early all the way up through early childhood. High school graduation rates uh, are connected back to the earlier years as well. Uh, and certainly middle school math, I keep beating the drum, middle school math, middle school math. <laughs> uh, movement on this, again, movement on the math uh, in middle school impacts the PI. Movement on those will also impact the PI through end of course assessments. The middle school grades will impact the value added, high school not so much. Um, gap closing, again, graduation rates, attendance rates, all gap cl closing activities. And then finally, the grad rate itself. Talk about growth, not going to hammer that anymore. High school, again, we came and we talked about what do we hear when we visit our schools, when we did sort of a deep dive root cause analysis them, with them. And, and when we looked at the data, wow, there was a really strong relationship between attendance and how kids did in school and whether or not they were on track. We need to in incentivize attendance. We have to continue to work on attendance. I don't think attendance is independent of school climate. Again, we heard a lot about school climate. Again, uh, NAEP, nationwide, they're hearing the same thing. They talked about uh, increased mental health needs, increased behavioral needs across the country. We're not alone. Everybody's struggling with the same things. So again, we really need to work, uh, move forward with our, uh, continue with our plan strategies to improve school climate and attendance. And then finally, um, it's really important to engage students in early opportunities to do credit recovery so that they get back on track as soon as possible so it doesn't build and snowball and become something that's so overwhelming that they don't have hope or see a pathway forward. I, I think one of the most important things when I think about high school is maintenance of hope so kids can see a path for themselves as they move forward. And with that, I talked as fast as I could. What questions might you have? So stop apologizing. This is literally why we are here. Yeah, it's true. Right? This is the most important presentation of the night. Uh, and this, this data is um, hard. Um, it's, um, you know, it shows, uh, again, how broken a system we have in terms of where urban education sits. Um, it shows the work we have to do to make systemic change. And it can't just be us in this room. It can't actually just be our kids and families. This has to be a bigger thing that, that we really want to try to change. Um, you know, it's so incredibly important that we change our adult behavior in terms of the way we interpret this state report card because our adult behavior makes our children feel bad and diminishes their hope. When different stars come out, and it's not what we see our suburban uh, friends doing. And so I think that, you know, talking about the data and, and uh, you know, talking about it more publicly and saying this is where we know we're going to be and this is what we're working on is so incredibly important. Um, so I want to thank you, Russ, for this. I found it, uh, you know, very refreshing. Um, and in terms of the work we need to do, it just makes us know we have a lot more to do. Um, also thanking all of the, the teachers and the um, counselors and the librarians and the food service workers and, you know, the custodians and the bus drivers, everybody really helps in an environment to help our children. Um, and so it's, it's incredibly important um, you know, this, this presentation. So stop apologizing for the length. <laughs> we might make you do another one even longer. <laughs> All right, so we're going to open it uh, up to questions uh, from board members. Board Member Brown. Um, <coughs> just, uh, I guess, in, in uh, a little bit larger picture, 
at some points you spoke about uh, comparisons with other districts, and at a lot of other points you, I, 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 you know, you were talking about progress, um, and and our own progress with ourselves. Are we doing, you know, getting more progress this year than we did last year? Those kinds of things. Um, how much validity and, and and what's the value? I guess of the comparisons with other school districts, whether suburban or other big urban. I know it's it's the number, you know, it's what a lot of people like to focus on. It's what the media like to talk about. But but you know, in in terms of our you know benefiting our own students. I think I heard two questions in there. So I'm gonna answer the last one first. Okay. Okay. I always think it's important to have context. So um, you know, I worked in Cleveland Metropolitan Schools for a long time, and, and I had the pleasure of working with Eric Gordon, and they've been on this path for a long time. And their performance isn't substantially different than ours. And so they've been working hard, they've closed the gap, they've caught up. <laughs> but So I think it's important to understand context. I do think knowing how other urbans within the state are doing and how we're going to all show up on the report card and a report card that was frankly designed by the legislature <laughs> and maybe doesn't help us, just got to say that out loud. <laughs> the second piece in terms of validity. Yes, I, I spent a lot of time talking about how we're doing. But I talked to how, about how we were doing relative to grade level performance. That grade level performance is set on a national scale. So we're measuring ourselves to a national benchmark all the time. And when we're setting growth targets, they're not growth targets based on us. They're based on the national performance. So when we're talking about meeting stretch growth, it's stretch growth for a like-scoring student anywhere in the country. So I think that's a really important distinction to make. So it, I would feel much less comfortable coming up here and talking about data and whether or not data was going to be predictive of outcome if it weren't anchored to something solid in the end. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Beckerly? Um, uh, in the category of the successes, um, I, I think that we have to be intentional about acknowledging them and let's be thoughtful about that. I'm trying to think of some things. I would also like to know, and this could just be a survey um, of the teachers and the instructors, um, and, and it may be too soon to tell, but I'm wondering how much of the improvement or the being on target for third grade uh, is driven by the letters and the foundations. And, you know, just, I, I'd just be curious to know if, if the teachers themselves feel like that's been a help or not. You know, it, and it just, it would be interesting to know, I think, to, uh, to understand what they think is working even. But that, because that's a big difference in the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, I think to your point about understanding this and looking at this and to President Adair's point about it's not designed for us and we don't want it to have a negative impact, I think that it, therein lies the wisdom of us having our own goals. So this is a little bit, it's not beside the point, it's just data that's helping inform what we do. And, and if we treat it that way a little more, I think that's important. I think it also reveals to me um, how important the goal on the portrait is. Because I think that's the goal and that's the work. If we get it right, where we're going to turn the achievement of our kids upside, not upside down, like reverse the trend completely and our, our students will store. Um, so I, I think... Precisely because we're in an urban and because of the who created the report card and how it's structured and all those things, I think we've got some secret sauce there. And um, let's um, make sure we um, get it right. Uh, and so, and thank you. And I'm probably going to spend a little more time with this report and then call you up and ask you a lot of questions, but <laughs> very much appreciate it. Dr. Pierce. Dr. Pierce. Go. No, you, you, no, you go, because I saw okay. my list. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for this report. And just, you know, for me, I guess I, I 
my question kind of lies around our special education kids. And so when I look at this data and I understand, you know, a lot of the information is kind of giving an average of all of our kids. But I guess for me, you know, I know we have a large percentage, a little over 8,000 just from last year's data of our kids who need additional services in order to achieve you know, what is defined here as portrait ready. Um, so I guess I wanna understand what exactly in our moving forward, what is our strategy for our special education kids? And, and I guess I, I don't see that anything kind of listed here in moving forward. So I guess I wanna understand how does this look for all of our students? And then specifically, I know it was mentioned, I believe on page 27, um, graduation, ELL, and attendance. I guess I wanna understand or just have more information about why do we think that is the strategy to improving our overall numbers? So can I, so this was alignment to the state report card. Mm -hmm. So I think that your questions are more addressed when to our goals and guardrails. Okay. So I think that's what Dr. Brown was trying to do, was try to demonstrate where we think we're gonna hit okay. when this report card comes out in September and the work we're underlying doing and pulling from the work we have. But I'll let you go ahead and answer if you have more specifics about it. I just wanna be clear that, that this was not about the deep dives that we do during monitoring. This was about the state report card. Ab absolutely, I uh, really was trying to look at you know, what are we doing in terms of our report goals? How does it align to the state report card? What can we anticipate on the state report card? Um, again, when I started this presentation, you know, I mentioned that, well, the board goals were adopted in, and the interims were adopted in November of last year, really a fairly short on-ramp. And the board goals, as you read them, are for the whole population. They aren't differentiated. So it isn't, you know, closing the, the gap in achievement for special ed or closing the, you know, in a former system, our goals were racially explicit. We had targets for black and indigenous students. Um, there are different ways board goals can be written, but the board goals right now, I think, are written in a, you know, overall. I think that makes sense. When you have two out of three kids who are below grade level um, and over-representation of special ed in kids who are the furthest, well, I think we have to look generally first. And then we have to talk about what does it mean to help kids grow? You know, again, I keep emphasizing growth. Well, kids who are special ed can grow. We need to think about what scaffolds, what resources uh, need, uh, we need to help make them grow. This is, this is new work for the system. We're looking at the overall. Over time, I expect us to iterate, and then we're gonna start saying, oh, hey, we made progress here, but we need to lean in and maybe think a little bit more deeply about this student population or that student population. But right now, I think we have to establish a foundational expectation of growth and monitor and growth, and then we'll learn more and lean in over time. But growth in particular, I think, favors uh, students who receive special ed services and students who receive second language services. It is essentially designed for that purpose and focuses on their needs. Thank you, and one follow-up question to that. Um, I think on page, it was page 35, you mentioned um, there was an uptick. Let me pull it up just to make sure I wrote that down right. Um, I got back up to 35. Yeah, maybe it was I'd 35. like to say. I it was, yeah, so we saw you mentioned just an uptick um, just in our ninth grade. Um, do, do we know what caused that uptick? Like, do we know um, it was not that, was that? No, it's different on my, I guess my PDF is different than yours. It was the one that says our goal two summary, and it had, it was for page 36, maybe one more. Yeah. This yes, one. this one. Okay. Um, so do you have, do we have any data or do we know what the uptick was or kind of what strategy really worked really well for our ninth grade population? So again, the that was the proportion of kids who were on track at the middle part of ninth grade. Okay. So at that point, they hadn't been in high school all that long. Okay. If you go to the next slide, they actually lost a little ground. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know that we have a secret sauce there. Okay. We need to be leaning in. And again, the things that we saw that really sort of stood out, and again, we, 
we did what I call a range finding activity when, when it came around to looking at this. We looked at the schools and how they were doing. And we visited some schools that were doing really well and had lots of kids on track. And we visited some schools where not many kids were on track. And we visited some schools in the middle. And what did we hear across that? And we also looked at data. And we saw that student attendance was a big driver. The kids who weren't coming to school regularly uh, were much less likely to be on track. Being in school matters. You know, being in front of our teachers matters. It's, it's, it's our most critical thing. And then what we heard that was sort of underlying that was kids were coming back and they had a lot of needs. There was a lot going on. And they really pointed to school climate. And we're investing time and energy to better understand school climate this year and develop a plan to move forward to address that. Because, um, you know, and this is work that I'm familiar with. We did this in Cleveland. I did it in Baltimore County. Building school culture is really, really important. Uh, it's sort of the mirror uh, uh, or part of pedagogy. So we can talk about content, but then we can talk about the how and the relationships. And those two things go together, and they're both very strongly predictive, predictive academic outcomes. So again, very, very early in the work. I think we have an idea of the path that we have to, to move forward on. Uh, we're just starting that, that sort of deep dive into climate uh, as we move forward. And I'm excited about seeing where that goes, because I, I know that can, that can move us. Thank you. Dr. Pierce. Yay, so you guys know I love data. So I have lots of questions. I sent you my questions in advance. So Thank you. hopefully you all are prepared to answer them. I tried um, to answer as many as I could as I went along. Uh, okay, well, you're ready. So um, when we talk about the weights that were given for the proficiency levels in ELA, as well as the graduation rates, do we assume that those are going to remain constant? I have no reason to believe that they would change. It's part of the state documentation for the report card. Now, that being said, the legislature can sometimes change things. Okay. <laughs> um, so as we are thinking about predictability, we can assume that for the next two to three years, as we are charting the goals and the guardrails that we've established, we have a pretty good North Star that we're trying to hit. We have, I think, a very solid North Star, both for third and third grade and high school uh, for graduation. And we have clear targets, and I think they're smart goals. They're realistic. I think they're achievable goals for both third grade and graduation. Graduation is going to be a little harder. Okay, so um, uh, slide 17. You show the OST outcomes for reading. You give our proficiency levels as well as our mid-year I-ready predictions, Yep. right? When you go to the raw data, there are more than several schools that are below our I-ready prediction um, and these levels that are shared. We have several schools that are in single-digit proficiencies. We have several schools that are at the 19 to 15 percent proficiency. What are we doing or intending to do to help those schools that are below these prediction levels and proficiency levels? Because there are several. So I'll take a swing at part of it, and then we may ask a couple of folks to, to come up. You can that. dial a friend. <laughs> we will dial a friend on some of this. Um, again, when we did um, school improvement planning last year for our schools, we aligned the school improvement planning process to the board goals. And you know, I think that ex it sets explicit targets for every, I mean, explicit targets were set for every school in the system at that point to, uh, to help move them forward and help focus their work uh, as they move forward on this. Um, you know, I, I know you've taught college. Uh, you're probably still doing that, right? No, you quit? I quit. Oh. I'm focusing on you, our students, and this data. Wow, okay. Well. I know when I taught, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there was a you know variability in performance in my class, and we have variability in performance across our schools. And again, we set up school improvement plans to support schools and to design the supports uh, necessary to help them. I know that there have been some additional resources that are aligned to be put into place to help this year, uh, and there are some folks behind me who are probably more articulate about those resources. 
I appreciate the variability, but when we look at the correlation between the schools that are scoring lower than the mid-year prediction and the proficiency levels in reading, there's also a correlation between those schools when it comes to outcomes in math. So that's showing me that it's happening in reading and in math. Mm -hmm. Now, veritability, my students, when I did teach black studies, I might have a veritability rate for my black studies students that may be different from my veritability rate for my women's studies students versus my black, uh, my political science students versus my public affairs students. Right. I don't use the same variability rate for all of them. There's going to be some difference. But in this data, as I look at the raw data building level, I'm starting to see correlations between lower performance and proficiency that is below our ready, our I-ready prediction and proficiency levels. So that shows me that there's something that is happening within those schools, potentially within a region, that telling students to get on I-ready for 20 or 40 minutes a day or um, it, it, our standardized district curriculum is not addressing. So one of the things that I've struggled with in terms of the regional look at things, 45% of our kids go to a school outside of their catchment area. So the regions or attendance boundaries don't necessarily tell me about where a kids lives or their opportunity based on, on where they live. Um, there are a lot of things that play into that. We, we all know that poverty is a, a large driver of student achievement. And I know that when I look across areas of the city here, there are some predictable differences in achievement that that could be attributed solely to, to differences in, in the affluence of the communities involved. Again, you're gonna see variability across the system. This is new work, and we are just beginning to lean into it. Um, I don't know if my colleagues would want to add in in terms of some of the things that we're leaning into to try to support schools, uh, but a, again, the, the idea is the school improvement planning process helps align the resources to support schools to be able to move things forward. Specifically, are we designating specific PD days to go over the data within the building level so they understand how they need to scaffold from third grade to fourth grade? Because even as I look at our schools that go K through 12 or the different grade band structures that we have, I'm also seeing some of those schools not meet the prediction and the proficiency levels that we have as a district. And that provides the perfect opportunity for scaffolding and variability. So I'm happy to say that I actually restructured part of my department to include one per region. Um, nice. Folks that are um, data literacy uh, coaches. They, they're folks who are on the pathway to become principals. Uh, it's a leadership internship position. And the objective there is to build data literacy across the system and to create uh, a series of building leaders who will enter their, their principalship or assistant principalship better prepared to do just what you're talking about. You made me smile with that one, Dr. Brown. I appreciate it. All right. So um, in your presentation, you talk about wanting to see... And I'm happy to see you smile. <laughs> <laughs> you indicate that some of the biggest gains that we'll see moving forward are going to come from our special education and ELL students, correct? I said that the focus on growth is growth imperative for, for those populations. Well, I'm putting it out in the universe. Yeah. Those students are going to show big gains for us. I'm a bit concerned because we have 82 IA vacancies right now, particularly working with those students. Um, now you're definitely out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> are we, um, do we have a strategy to ensure that we are recruiting IAs to go into uh, those classrooms to help our students where we need to see the largest growth? So I'm going to go ahead. You can, you can answer. I, um, these are all extremely important questions. Um, this is not a monitoring session. And we kind of are off the topic of this at this presentation. All very relevant, super important questions. Um, but we do have more on our agenda this evening. So um, if we want to have this discussion, I suggest we put it on the agenda so that we all can be prepared to have it um, or incorporate it into a monitoring session as the goals are coming up. Well, Go ahead and answer this question. And then if you have any more specific questions, because I know you, I know, I already, I read your list of questions. I know you have a lot. So if there's ones that are focused more on this report for time, 
that would be um, my request if you would ask those. And then the rest of them we can address in the future or by writing. Well, I think given Dr. Brown's response, this definitely aligns with it. If we expect to see this growth in our ELL students in special education, and we also have data indicating that we have a need in IAs. It's yeah, I'm not disagreeing with the importance of the question or where you're going. It's very important. Um, I'm just saying in, in terms of what is on our agenda for this evening, it's a little bit out of the lines. I've let it go on a little bit because they are very important questions, but I know how many you have, and so um, we just I'm need to get most of back on back on track. So I'll let you answer this one, Great. Um, and then we'll just move on. Hello, board members. Hello. Um, hi, Missy actually sent me this question earlier, and so you have a very long response from me. Um, I'll give you some of our short response. So yes, um, I think it was uh, within two months we had every I SPED IA vacancy filled. Um, and then we saw a lot of people leaving at the beginning of the school year. And so we are doing focused community-based rec recruitment now, um, which is really starting to pay gains. Um, so the team chose one school per every region. We're gonna start doing this model more and more so that we're um, recruiting directly from our communities. We're putting together um, multilingual Recruitment resources, which are really paying dividends as well, so that we can make sure that we're getting, um, for especially our ESL populations, the, the staff who can actually support the students in the building uh, appropriately. Um, we have a ongoing career fairs happening at Central Enrollment so that we can um, hopefully catch some of our parents as they come in um, to see if they can also be uh, employees of the district. Um, and then we have a lot of career opportunities coming up um, in terms of career fairs that we're going to. We were just at the Latino, Latino Festival. We were just at the African American Wellness Walk. So we're, we're constantly out there in community trying to fill these vacancies. A lot of them came up recently, which is really unfortunate. Um, so we're, we're gonna attack it as much as possible. Much appreciated. Yeah, of course. Um, if there's anything that the board can do to help you attack that, especially since yes. these two student populations have been identified as us really needing to show growth, that would be great. Yes, there there will be some things uh, that you can help us with shortly. Um, so I look forward to coming back to you with those. Excellent. Thank you. I guess my last most important question then gets at go to, and I've reiterated this um, in multiple monitoring sessions when it comes to this go. Here we have data again showing that at the particular point where we are monitoring, our freshmen are on track, and then they quickly get off track sophomore and junior year. Again, I pose the question to our administration and to our board if that goal is off, if we need to revise that goal to look at a different data point in the timeline for that high school matriculation, um, or if we need to change that goal entirely. Um, where it is at currently, we get a pat on the back when we monitor it because they're on track as freshmen, but then they quickly fall off track as sophomores and juniors. I do think that's a disservice, and again, um, and I think our uh, consultant, A.J. Crable, has also shared that this goal needs to be adjusted. And so again, I bring it to the board that we need to look at adjusting goal number two. So I, the, yes, we yeah. do, and so we can do that, so you don't need to answer. Thank you. All right. I think that, yeah, I think that we are good. Thank you so much for your, your report. Back to you, Dr. Dixon, for anything yeah. else? Nope, that's it. That concludes my report for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right, over to the internal auditor. Hello, Auditor Smith. Good afternoon, President Adair, uh, members of the board. I do not have a formal report tonight because we just had out an accountability on Thursday. Um, so I will have a report at our next meeting, but I uh, just wanted to share that typically around this time, the Auditor of State would have come and did their opening conference, uh, but because of challenges with their schedule, they have postponed that until our September, I think, 29th meeting. Um, other than that, I will have a uh, more specific report at the next board meeting. Thank you. Uh, and over to the Treasurer. Hello, Mr. Treasurer. Good evening. Uh, this evening, 
I should have here on the screen fairly soon the quarterly report for quarter four of fiscal uh, last fiscal year, fiscal 20, fiscal year uh, 2022. Um, if I can get by with operating it here, maybe, maybe not. There we go. Okay, this is the quarterly report for quarter four, fiscal 22. Just a reminder of, of um, what your written report uh, looks like. It um, starts with an executive summary, about three pages, uh, goes into a little bit more detail for the ne next six pages uh, discussing the major revenue and expenditure groups. And then uh, lastly, you get a much more detailed report, about 13 pages on the each line item by line item um, breakdown. Uh, year to date, uh, at the end of the fiscal year, revenues, total revenues ended up uh, above plan 11.4 million, about 1.4 percent. So we're very much in total on target there. Uh, total expenditures, 75.2 million above plan, about uh, almost 10 percent, 9.7 percent above plan. Uh, that's largely due to non-operational, uh, non-personnel expenditures that I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, but uh, that variance took our cash balance down uh, about 63.8 million under plan to end the year. When we look at total revenues, uh, focusing in on uh, quarter four, these reports I give you will kind of they progress left to right as, as each quarter is completed. So you'll see the plan for the full year, but then the, the actual data comes into play as each quarter goes by. Um, in quarter four, uh, again, um, we were about 10.7 million under for the quarter four, uh, largely due to state aid uh, running under plan. Um, we're finding now, and this will be one of my comments later on about where we're headed in state aid is, uh, in terms of updating our five-year forecast. Um, we now are formula-driven, so numbers of kids, uh, the, the perception of wealth in the district and the formula is driving this, and, and we're seeing that it did come in below uh, what we had originally estimated uh, for the year. But quarter four, um, uh, again, down about 10.7%. Uh, we can see here, this is just the dollar amounts um, uh, for um, uh, the change each quarter. On a year-to-date basis, there's the 11.4 in the far right-hand, far in the far right-hand graph. Again, about 1.4 percent um, uh, under for the year. So very, very close. If I felt good about the revenue estimates, I'm not um, so happy with the reduced state aid, but at least we know what's driving that and have a very detailed model now for, for um, trying to project it, not predict it, but project it uh, for, the, for the out years. On the expenditure side, uh, the most notable thing you can see there for quarter four uh, is that um, it, it ran about 68.7 million above plan, 75 million of that others ran under, no, most notably personnel, but um, 75 point, uh, 75 million of that was in the non-operating non-personnel, all related to advances out at the end of the year. Um, at the end of the year, the general fund acts as banker to all other funds, and we need to cover the unencumbered, une unexpended unencumbered balances of other funds. The ESSER fund is a very large fund. The ESSER fund required $76 million in advance, and typically we do about $10 million to cover everything at the end of the year. So this was a, a big jump, um, uh, unanticipated and unexpected. Uh, the good news is it's an advance. So it's an accounting transaction. It goes out in June, comes back in July. We anticipate in the next forecast, as we're building that, that this will happen for the next two to three years. When ESSER expires, we go back to a more normal situation. So it'll cause a bit of an aberration in the, in the first two to three years of the forecast, but when we get to the fifth year and on, when we begin to use that forecast for levy planning, it will have worked itself out. But that's the, the, uh, the biggest um, um, item there in the fourth quarter. You can see that it does uh, literally stand out like a sore thumb that that um, uh, variance in the fourth quarter uh, is, is most notable. When we look on a percentage basis uh, year to date, um, I would like to point out it's the right graph um, for the third quarter. We were within 1.2% of total expenditures on plan. Um, 
and while we're 9.7 above, had that $76 million not been needed to be transferred out, we would have been really, really close to on plan. So we would have been in that 1% to 2% both in revenue and expenditures. We would have ended up with the cash balance as we expected pretty much. So um, some of these aberrations, these, these, these um, you know, short-lived uh, changes um, and events uh, um, have caused this kind of short-term uh, um, issue here in, in, in terms of how the end of the year um, ended. I, I will say that in the area of personnel, in the fourth quarter, uh, we had ESSER pick up the cost of our wellness week, three days of wellness week, and so we moved seven and a half million out of the general fund over to ESSER, and that brought um, our personnel down to close to 14 million under plan. Had we not done that, we would have, again, been very close within a 1% of our overall rev, uh, expenditure estimate for personnel. So um, having ESSER seems to be both um, uh, a blessing and a, and a curse a little bit, but these are simply, you know, accounting issues right now um, in terms of, of what, what the impact of, of ESSER had. So we ended the year, as I said, uh, just a little bit above in revenue, quite a bit more in my, in my uh, opinion in expenditures. Uh, we know what the explanations are and what their long-term impacts will be. Um, next on the horizon for FAC is, um, and for me and my team, is to prepare the November uh, uh, forecast. Um, I want to go over a few of the variables, just kind of maybe a spoiler alert or get you ready for what's going to be coming uh, down the pike. Um, as you know, I'll present the forecast to FAC in October. You, the board, will see a presentation of the first meeting in November and then adopt it in the second meeting in November. I always mention at the end of the forecast some key factors or variables or risks to the forecast. And I've, I'm, I want to walk through several of them and kind of give you my feel for whether it's favorable or unfavorable in terms of cash balance. You know, cash balance seems to be a hot topic. Uh, we, hear about it a lot. I know the General Assembly is looking at districts' cash balances, and, and uh, quite frankly, folks will look at a large cash balance, uh, over $200 million, to say, well, you've got the cash. On the General Assembly side, they'll say, well, you don't really need any more. And uh, perhaps to the general public, say, well, you've got the cash. Why don't you just spend it, you know, fix the buildings, build the buildings, whatever. I don't do your, your financial planning that way. Uh, because of, of the way school funding works, you tend to build balances after a levy and spend them down over time. And, and so having a, a, a large, what you might consider a large cash balance today, is a good thing because I need that for the next two to three to four to five years as, we, as, rev, as revenues don't meet ongoing expenditures. That's the purpose of the forecast. So I'm going to speak to this in terms of favorable or unfavorable in terms of the cash balance, either building a cash balance or depleting your cash balance. Um, walking down kind of an income statement, let's talk about property taxes. What do I feel is going to happen between uh, May of, of this past year and now in November as we're looking at? Understand that our ability um, to protect our property tax base is, is, is under attack and has been attacked. You know very well, and, and uh, Mr. Barnes has spoken to this, um, about our, our uh, ability to go before the Board of Revision and, and make challenges uh, to reductions, requests for reductions in property values. That's been severely restricted, and you're going to see a whole new process for that coming to you here in, in uh, the coming months. Uh, but that is unfavorable for us in terms of being able to protect our tax base, and it will result in uh, potential losses of, of tax revenue. Uh, we are no longer uh, permitted to enter into these settlements. We call them pilots, payments in lieu of taxes. So rather than going through that complete Board of Revision and Board of Tax Bill process, we can negotiate, uh, the tax, commercial taxpayer can negotiate with us a settlement of, of those um, values. And we get payments, direct payments, rather than going through the normal property tax payment system. Those are no longer available. I told you before, about $12.5 million a year I've pulled out of the forecast um, there. That process, uh, and, and I will be bringing to FAC a, a, a point, a summary of the decades that we've done this and the millions of dollars 
that it is either saved or generated for the district over time. That process of, of being able to reach those settlements has been taken away from us. Unfavorable for cash balance. State aid, um, two quick things. One, well, first, you know we're on a formula. It's typically enrollment times a dollar amount times a factor that the state says that they'll pay. It's, it's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, one of the things that drives the factor that the state will pay or the state share is kind of the inverse of that, the local share. And the local share is driven by um, kind of how wealthy are you. Two factors there, federal adjusted gross income and property valuation. Well, our federal AGI is going up. Our property value is going up. Those are the numerators. In the denominator, number of pupils. Our enrollment is going down. Pretty simple math. That means our local share, that percentage, is going up. It's a zero sum game, sums, sums to one. So if, if we owe a certain percentage, you subtract it from one, that's the state share percentage. Here, just recently, we looked at it. We dropped from something like 32% state share to 29% state share. So when you get into the formula, you take the number of pupils, which is less, times a dollar amount for that particular category of aid, times a lower percentage, state aid's going down. And we have now, um, I just went through it today with uh, Matt in my office. He has built that model out very detailed, much more detailed than we've had in the past because we were capped in the past. We didn't have to project or predict or assess those numbers because we simply were capped. Um, now he's got that built out for the, for the entire next forecast. And so we can look at all those intervening factors. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're projecting declining enrollment. And, and so that means that um, we'll have declining state aid. Used to be that we thought it was conservative enough to just do flat state aid. Pretty much we're going to stick with, with probably some declining state aid. Also on the state aid front, um, I would say that the General Assembly, the general tenor, overall tenor, although there are those that have been champions of, of the new funding formula, uh, champions of phasing in the funding for the new fund, funding formula. Um, the last one, Representative Cup is um, term limited, so we don't know who's going to champion that in the House. Um, there's a pension to, I'll just say it, there's a pension to fund vouchers and not fund K-12. And so we're at risk there. We face a new state budget this spring. I do not know what, that, what, the, what the future of the formula might be or of whether or not phased in funding will continue. Um, so we're going to have to take a look at that and factor that into the November forecast. Again, unfavorable for cash balance. Um, personnel, uh, you know we have a new negotiated agreement. We have another association that has a Me Too. Um, as you know, that I had uh, in the formula, or I'm sorry, in the forecast, had included the increases that were in the existing collective bargaining agreements at, um, uh, you know, uh, it was two and a quarter for OPC, three percent for CEA, up to a point till they expire. Um, so OPC has a Me Too. It will be doing the back pay on the 4% uh, the differential between the, the two. Um, and I think another big change will be I'll be uh, putting into the forecast and, and confirming with, with FAC that in the out years, I was using 1%. Um, I think that's probably an unrealistic um, assumption. I'll be building in something bigger than that. Um, um, and I'll share that when I get the, the forecast built. But that too, and I'm going to say is unfavorable to cash balance but I'm not saying it's, an un it's not a legitimate expense. I'm just saying that that is an increase in that 80% of our forecast in the out years. That will, bode us w that will bode well for us in terms of our long-term financial planning so that we size the next operating levy um, um, appropriately. You, know, you, you don't want to be too conservative or aggressive uh, uh, in both revenue expenditures, but we're, we're going to hone in on that. Uh, as best we can, um, and that is one of the variables that I think we need to change in the out years so that we make sure that the next request is adequate to carry us for the term that we expect this next levy to last. Um, the other thing is the fiscal cliff that ESSER might uh, create. We have um, a, a pretty large number of personnel currently being funded by ESSER. By November, um, I'm going to have to put in a number. Um, it's not a binding number, but I've got to put something in 
to indicate that some of those folks are likely to come over to the general fund. They're not all going to go away. So I'm going to have to build that in. That is great for academics, great for our program. It's unfavorable for cash balance because we're going to spend those dollars out of the general fund. Um, that's it for general fund, the quarterly report, and the financial forecast, kind of a spoiler alert. Um, I would just say one last comment to kind of harken back to your conversations, especially with uh, Mr. Trevino, about the capital expenditures. And my question would have been, Alex, do you have enough money to pay for that? Um, I will be coming to you next month because his capital budget that he presented in the spring was for some $40 million. We moved for, we transferred $4.1 million in 22 to a capital fund. We're going to bring, bring a request to transfer another 36 and change. Oh, he, I thought, I thought perhaps Alex, Alex would be dancing in the, in the <laughs> seat back there, but that's a, that another $36 million to a, a, a PI fund. The rest of the funding for the capital budget comes from the PI levy, which is no longer on the ballot. Um, and what does that mean? It means that if should you choose, you being the board, choose to put that on in calendar year 23, that funding won't begin to flow until calendar year 24. So we, his plans are now at least a year delayed in terms of, of continuing with capital improvements. We have not spoken uh, specifically about HVAC projects, those kinds of details, um, but um, you know, projects come up all the time. And I, the last thing I read from Alex was, well, if I spend the money over here, that means I don't have money for this project over there. He's operating on a limited resource um, a model. He's got a great list of needs and a very much smaller list of, of resources. So, uh, you know, if you've got to spend it over here, you can't spend it over here. So that's the last thing I would say about that. Um, more to come. Uh, FAC meets next uh, Wednesday right here at 4 p.m. Um, I think we have an ESSER update on the agenda and our monthly financial reports, the transfer, and uh, some other budgeting issues on the agenda um, that we'll be there to discuss. So that's, that's it for this evening. Um, thanks for the time, and I'll try and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, uh, Board Member Beckerley. Um, I think I followed all of the um, ins and outs of the state funding. You kept using the word phased in funding, and part right. of that has to do, tell me if I'm correct, with the formula not being fully funded. Correct. Okay. And as, so, it was as was introduced, it was a six-year phase in. Okay. Um, and that, that um, uh, was proposed. Um, they did not commit to that six-year phase in. We got the first two years of that. Okay. So far. So part of what's in play in this next budget cycle, in addition to everything else, is whether they continue to increase the percentage of the formula that is actually funded. That is correct. OK. Um, second thing, and this is a request, the, the, your last topic about um, the current plan to move 30 some odd million to permanent improvement and then what that covers and what that doesn't cover. Can we get a presentation on that on one of our upcoming sooner rather than later board agendas? That would just be my request, an agenda item where we kind of get that spelled out for us. That's an Alex it, Dan question. It's kind of an Alex question. The, the funding answer is, is simple. Um, there, is, there isn't <laughs> any. Um, I mean, that's the simple part. And I think Alex mentioned earlier that he's actually, you know, working on an on a okay, overall good. plan. Uh, I think now, we need to keep talking about that, I guess. In is defense my point. of Alex a little bit. Oh, I'm not the, the the playing field keeps moving on him. Oh yeah. And and I, I quite you know, I press him. I go, Alex, I need to know, I need to know. And he goes, Well, they just somebody changed the <laughs> table on me here. We did. And and it's and it's hard hard to plan. Um, it would be a lot easier if we had funding in place. And, you know, I did present to FAC, and which is why I presented to you in, in uh, the 4.7 mil PI levy. It was uh, a 20 to 25-year model sure. using his numbers and, and extrapolating that over that period of time. 
and say, well, we need X each year to do this. If that were in place, he would be a happier man in terms of planning for facilities upkeep, I believe. Um, and I think Dr. James would be. Yes, as he's well. nodding. Um, but yeah, that. We got to get on. We have to get on solid ground here pretty soon. And, and th this might actually be a Dr. James question, but um, I really feel like, as a board, we did something um, that was really important, and critical, when we first talked in February about run to fail. I don't. I don't think those words were uttered at a board t table before. And we started down that path of really talking about this and brass tacks, what it is, what it isn't, what the, what's in play. And so, and so I guess Dr. James, Stan, Alex, whomever, let's keep that conversation going. And, and let's, whether we have a standing agenda item, whether we, I, I mean, I'm not, I don't know exactly how, but I think that we as a board need to keep talking about that and keeping it on our minds and in the public's mind. So that's my two cents. Sure. Other questions? Looks like no more questions. Beautiful. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we um, are now in our board matters, and we have correction to traditional calendar, academic calendar, and we have General Counsel Barnes. Good evening. This should be relatively relatively quick. The, as, as you recall, at your April 20th meeting, you approved the school calendars for 22-23 for both the traditional calendar and the year-long Woodcrest calendar. The only change here is to the traditional calendar. The only change within that calendar is a professional day, moving it from October 14th to October 21st. The reason for that is a provision in the OPSI contract, which provides a professional day on the third day of October, which this year is October 21st. That is the only change. And because of, oh, I'm sorry. You mean Friday? It, it is a Friday. That is the only, that is the only Friday professional day throughout the year. And the, pre, the 14th is a Friday, the 21st is a Friday, so it's just the following. You just said th third no, day. Oh, did I? Day of October. Oh, 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 I'm it's sorry. third Friday, that's all. I'm sorry, it's, it's late in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> the third Friday okay. of October. And pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 3313.48, it does have to come back before you. And according to the statute, we also have to wait until 30 days before you can actually vote on the approval. So I will be back before you. Uh, for your vote on the on the move of the professional day. Unless there are any questions. Any questions for General Counsel Barnes? Oh, I have. Looks like no questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, item 7.2. This is the second reading of Board Policy 2000 on equity. Uh, Board Member Brown. Thank you. Um, I think everybody has seen this draft multiple times, and uh, uh, there has not been any further comment, discussion, input of any kind. Uh, it is here tonight. It is here tonight for approval, um, and uh, I, I presented it. It becomes recommended by the policy committee and. Carol, is there something that I'm missing? Yeah, I, well, I have a, I have a, want to, will we have an opportunity to discuss it? Yes, we will. Yes. Yeah. He, uh, I've, I've moved 
uh, approval. Okay, so Br um, Brown has made the motion. Is there a second? Second. All right, now we can have discussion. Board Member Beckerley. Okay, I am. Um, I want to be clear. I I'm not uh, not in support of our taking equity seriously. i and I very much like the definitions of equity that are in this policy. Um, I am a purist when it comes to <laughs> student outcomes focused governance, and I think that for board policies, our criteria are: is it um, necessary to implement a goal or a guardrail. And our goals and guardrails discuss equity, and we use the term equity. So I think the definition of it is really important, and that we provide as a board what we mean it to be and not be in the distinction between equality and equity. So that part I am totally on board with. I think there's other language in here that sort of um, suggests and implies additional obligations on the part of um, the superintendent and the board that are outside of what we would expect in a policy diet. I think some of them are appropriate and could easily be in an administrative guideline issued by the superintendent. But I think that um, if we're trying to adhere to the student outcomes focused governance framework and the particular their um, guidelines about policies, we have to be very narrow in what sorts of policies we um, adopt at the board level and their role. So I'm explaining why I'm going to vote no on this policy. And I just want to be very clear that it is not because I am um, not in favor of equity. <laughs> I just think that we're implementing it through our goals and guardrails, and that's our vehicle. And I particularly want to make clear that I appreciate the definition, the distinction between equity and equality. If I could. Governor Brown. A few things, and I, I've had that conversation with Carol. Um, and uh, I agree that those two definitions uh, are the key here, and that the public doesn't always have a general understanding or appreciation for the difference. And we're committed to equity means that we're going to lift up those who are most vulnerable, those who are at greatest need. Uh, as far as, you know, this policy has been in the works for quite some time. Two years? Three years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, all of this, nearly all of this was done prior to uh, the policy governance approach that we're now taking and before any thought was given to policy diet. Right. And, and that's fair. My suggestion is that, yes, we need to work on that. And yes, we need to make adjustments, not only to this proposed policy, but, you know, well, and we've, we've agreed to do that, and yet we haven't started that yet. I suggest that we pass this tonight, get it on the books, it's important and that we agree that as we go through the policy diet, we're going to clean up this and lots more through that book. Um, and, and I think we should, but it's, it's, I think it's overdue. Um, you know, to, to just put in writing and, and, and confirm what we all believe. Dr. Pierce. If I might add, so um, Board Member Brown, thank you for that. Um, as we um, went out into the community and talked about how excited we were to work with Dr. Dixon, um, Board Member Beckerley, when we were running for office, one of the things that we discussed was our equity policy, that um, Dr. Dixon was able to establish that in her district. Um, having been the person that actually wrote the legislation and worked with our committee to pare it down and to change it and to work with Dr. Blue to further change it across these three years, I echo Board Member Brown, it is long overdue that we pass this piece of legislation. The data that was presented today shows us that we need to address the inequities within our district. And adopting this policy will be the first step 
and us doing that coupled with our goals and guardrails, working together in tandem and putting our students first with our equity policy, with our goals and guardrails, as well as the portrait of a graduate, I think we will be able to move our district forward in positive ways. And that is why I am voting yes for the policy tonight. Thank you, any other comments? Please call the roll. Ms. Beckerley? No. Mr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Pierce? Yes. Vice President Reyes? Yes. Ms. Vera? Yes. President Adair? Yes. Motion carried. All right. Okay. Um, we are now into item 7.3, discussion on board implementation timeline. Board Member Be Beckerley. And you, do you want to do 7.4 as well? Yeah, I just lost it here on my computer. I'm wondering if... Um, Mr. Crable is available to weigh in, or is he just listening in? He, he's oh, on. Weigh yeah. In. He's on. Weigh in on uh, the, cal the calendar. The timeline and the calendar and all of that. AJ, are you able to join us? He's on. I don't know if he's like, there he is. Okay. Um, all right. Oh. So I think we can start with the... Um, Implementation timeline, the, the self-evaluation is probably the first place we should start, which is a different document than that's up right now. And we have it in front of us here in a hard copy, along with um, our um, SOFG rubric. Thank you. So... Um, the way this works is we are to go through the April to June time frame and give ourselves um, a grade along, uh, in accordance with this rubric. Have we stayed the same? Have we improved? And so if we start with vision and goals, From January to March, we gave ourselves 25. So that means that we agreed that all our goals pertain to student outcomes. I'm looking at the column that says meeting student outcomes. It's green. So we gave ourselves a yes for that. We have, remember, we have to get every, hit every criteria in order to give ourselves the points. Otherwise, we drop down to the previous level in the rubric. Um, in addition to the goal ending points, the board has adopted annual targets, goal ending points for each year leading up to the ending date. So superintendents provide interim goals. Now we have that, um, I believe, um, if our uh, AV friends can pull up the goals and guardrails with the interims. I just wanted to take a minute to look at those for a second. because I just wanted to highlight that um, if you could scroll down to the interim goals for, uh, yeah, there we are. So we have the understanding of this one, if we give ourselves credit for this, is that um, we're still to the 2BD for the um, portrait goals, interims, because we haven't established those yet. So I just want to you know, highlight that while we may give ourselves full credit for this, we have to understand that when it comes to the um, portrait of a graduate goal number three, we don't actually have interims yet because we haven't figured that out. But I, I, I'm, I think that's okay. I just want to make sure we're all aware of that, that we're giving ourselves credit for that, even though those are to be day. Um, all interim goals pertain to student outputs or student outcomes. Yes, I think we're comfortable with that. We've been over that already. Um, the board included student staff and community and members in the goal development process. We did way back when. Um, all board goals last from three years to five years in interims, yes. Um, the goals and interims will challenge the organization and require change. So we agree that we're there. And then the question is, do we, have we might improve to the point that we can be in the mastering category? So I don't know if one, somebody other than me wants to look through some of those criteria and weigh in. I would say no. I'd say we're in the same spot. Okay. 
All right. So let the record reflect we stay at um, 25 meeting student outcome goals for the values and the guardrail, uh, for the visions rather, and goals. Then we go to the values and the guardrails. We were at five last time, which means we didn't get to 10. So let's go through 10 and see if we're there now. I mean, uh, not 10, rather, meetings outcomes focus, which is the 10 points. It's the, um, the green. The superintendent has provided interim guardrail ending points for each year leading up to the ending date. Um, if you could scroll down to the guardrails, I think that we have ending points for each year. I'm trying to remember. I think there might have been some where we actually had two BDs still. Is that correct there? I can't see it from here. Those last two there. Now again, that's because we're in the process of creating these metrics, but I just want to make sure everyone's aware that technically we don't have ending points for those time frames, for those particular guardrails. Um, the board, the, the guardrails pertain to outcomes, outputs not outcomes. Yes, I think we've been through that and concluded they did. The board includes students, parents, staff. We've got that one. The board has considered adoption of one or more theories of actions to drive school systems overall strategic plan. If there's a permanent, uh, that person was included in the theory, um, the superintendent was included in the theory consideration process. AJ, can you weigh in on this? Because we, we have, I mean, we haven't technically considered theories of action. That's correct. This is not a conversation the uh, board is engaged in. So by that, by definition, that knocks us down to approaching rather than meeting? Yes. OK, well, then maybe that's, oh, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Um, AJ, I like your haircut. Yeah, you, you're looking you sharp today, bruh. You're looking good. <laughs> um, so I have documentation. I like to keep paper. Um, indicating that in our monitoring reports, the superintendent and her team did provide us with theories of actions, and we did discuss those on three different occasions. So is it that we need to adopt those specific theories of action, or, again, I can provide paperwork that Dr. Dixon and no, her administration did, yeah. has given us theories of action? If this is something that the board has considered, whether you chose to adopt something or not is not relevant. What's relevant is if this is something that the board has considered, then you have then you have done your task of deciding whether or not that makes sense for you all. Um, and and then yes, in that situation, then you get credit for having completed that work. Okay. If the board has not had that conversation, then you don't. So um, if you all had that, and I'm just not privy to it, then so be it. Well, let me, can I just ask the question then, because we have definitely talked about theories of action that have been presented by the administration as their theory of action as to how to improve attendance or improve, but the board, is there, I, my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is that this theory of action is talking about a theory of action that the board is embracing for the whole system, that it's a, it's a yeah, board. And, and, and I am not familiar with the board considering adoption of a theory of action. If the board has done that, then you're good here. If what the board has heard is the administration saying, here's you know, what is driving our behavior, um, that's really great information to know. But that's not the same thing as the board articulating, here is a global theory of action that we expect to see drive the selection of inputs and outputs throughout the system. Um, and so again, if the board has had that conversation, the board has contemplated, here is a theory of action, global theory of action that we um, are adopting and that the superintendent is obligated to pursue, um, then yes, you absolutely get credit for that. If that has not happened, then you would not. Okay, I, I don't believe that's happened. We didn't discuss it in the way he's talking yeah. about. We did not. No, we did not. Theories of action that we did discuss were presented to us by the administration that explained their thinking as opposed to the board saying this is our global, like so for example, if I could <laughs> wave a magic wand, my theory of action would be that every decision by every support 
function in this district, they have to say, how am I facilitating the work of the teachers, the students, uh, the teachers, the social workers, everybody who has direct interaction. Like, to me, that would be a, a, a universal global uh, theory of action for the whole organization. And that's the conversation I don't think we've had. How, how, were, how so, were we supposed to have that? We just never got to it. We just, it was supposed to be a workshop or something that we didn't do? And we, you've just not gotten that far into the process. Uh, you all are still you know, working in that direction. Um, some, for some districts, this is already built into the goals and guardrail development work because they already have a global theory of action for the school system. And they use that as an opportunity to codify it. When we brought this conversation up long ago, when you all began on this process, that was one of the things I inquired about. And at the time, you all did not have a theory of action that the district was operating under. Um, and so there was not anything to go back to the community to affirm. Uh, that being said, if you can always do so going forward, uh, this is a little bit more of an advanced feature of a governing body. Um, you all, my opinion is this time last year, you all were not in a place to have that type of a conversation just because you were still struggling to understand what your baseline priorities were and your goals and guardrails. I think you all are in more of a position to be able to have that conversation now. Quick question. So suppose our portrait of a graduate was our theory of action. I mean, we've been talking about our portrait of a graduate and aligning it with our goals and guardrails. And again, it, it's been a, um, a, I don't want to say package, I guess I could use a better word than package, but it has been given together as a part of the strategies that we're using to impact student success. So we could absolutely sit down with your portrait of a graduate and from that derive a theory of action. Um, as it currently exists, it's not described as such, but you could certainly do so. And that's a process I could guide you all through. Um, what I would recommend um, is first to have a conversation about what a theory of action is and then let the board decide if you feel like that is, if the, if your portrait of a graduate matches that for you, and if it does, then that's a fairly easy process. But as you all dive into kind of what is a theory of action, and you think to yourself, and you look at some other examples from other districts, and you come to the conclusion that no, that's not, that doesn't fully reach it for us, then we can go through a process for identifying what, that, what would fit for you. Okay, so then it sounds like we did not make any movement on this and we need to work on theory of action. And, and it sounds like we need to schedule yet another workshop with AJ or uh, someone else, right? <laughs> okay, monitoring and accountability. Um, I guess we should start with uh, uh, Misty's uh, board, use, board time use evaluations for the past, for April to June. So if our friends in the AV world could pull up the time use evaluations, because we have to see if we're, um, if we hit 25% or if we're till, still at 10%. So when you scroll down, where are we? I can't, it, it's hard to see that. Um, yeah, if you can scroll down to the bottom. Oh, goal monitoring. No, no, never mind. Sorry. It looks like we're at for. Is that a 30 percent? Yes. For which month? I don't know what month that is. is. Misty, can you tell which month that is? Oh, she's back there. She's back there. That's April. OK, so we're at 30 percent for April. That's good. Could we see March? Zero percent for March. Okay, and oh no, not March. 
April, May. Sorry, May, May, May. I'm going in the wrong direction. Twenty one percent, okay. In June. Okay, so June is zero. So we did not hit twenty five percent. So I guess that puts us in approaching student outcomes focus. Um, but I want to go down that list uh, to get to the board's on the one, two, three, four criteria down on that approaching student outcomes focus um, category in the rubric. It says the board's monitoring calendar spans the length of the board's goals. A longer span allows for more focus, shorter allows for less. So now I'm going to ask um, you to pull up the monitoring calendar. Because I, this is another thing I think that we need to put a pin in, or at least maybe not put a pin in, maybe put a pin in. We need to understand that um, at some point, this monitoring calendar only goes for three years. Not um, If you could just scroll down to show everyone that this just goes for three years and not five. And at some point, oh, there you go. At some point, we did have a five-year calendar, and I'm not sure what happened. But the one that we approved is only for three years. And also, I'm noting that I think there's been some edits to it. Well, maybe this is the one we approved. But then the one that we just had up had some red lining in it. So I think that, um, and, and I'm happy to take this as an action item to get to the bottom of where we are with our monitoring calendar, because it really is supposed to be for five years. Um, because technically, I think the fact that it only runs for three and that it looks like we've been editing it. Um, without the board approving a new monitoring calendar based on the edits, we might have to drop down to zero on this if we're really being um, earnest in our grading. But um, let me, oh, we were at zero to begin with? Oh, we were at zero. OK, well, then we'll stay there. But I, I would like to um, try to um, take the action item unless somebody else wants to. <laughs> Good. Great, Carol. Thanks. All right. I just did it. OK, good. Communication and collaboration. And uh, before you step forward to that, <clears throat> just an editorial note. Uh, this is where the board's actions demonstrate the strength of its convictions um, as much as anywhere in this document. Um, and so if this is an area where the board wants to grow, if you actually want to say, here are the things we value, and you want your actions to back that up, this is the area where you want to win. You want to design your use of time to make your students learning the center of your focus. That is clearly um, not what the data currently indicates. And so I just want to check in with the board before you move on to the next item on this self-evaluation. Is that still the board's intention um, and if so, um, I think your board chair needs to be clear that she still has a consensus of the board to make your student learning, actually monitoring student progress, the focal point of your governance work each month. Um, because if she has your imprimatur to do so, then that frees her up to make some fairly aggressive uh, changes to your agenda and your meeting calendar on a month-to-month -month basis. If it is not your intention to make that the focus, she needs to know that so that she doesn't begin the process of prioritizing that. And so before we move on to the next item, this is a particularly useful uh, clarity to attain. What say you? It is important. Nobody, it is important. I think we've been working with uh, Dr. Dixon. We meaning. Um, uh, well, I think what AJ is saying, because we're off track, we're off track on our monitoring. And so in order to get back on track, because we've missed a couple sessions, we're either going to have to do more in a month, so not during one meeting, but both meetings, or have special meetings, or rearrange agendas. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I think he's trying to say, is what is our commitment to getting back back into this because we did fall 
Um, and so I, I think that's where he's going. So it just means more work for us. Um, and we have to kind of figure out how to do that, whether, again, that be a special meeting, it be arrange and rearrange an agenda, have two monitoring sessions. Like, that's what I think. I think, right, AJ, is that where you're going? Yeah, I don't know that you all will do more work to get yourself out of this. I think you're going to have to do different work mm -hmm. to get yourself into honoring your priorities, which means assume you take the meeting schedule that you have, assume that half of your time together each month gets focused on student learning. That means since you're spending very little time on that right now, that means compressing half of what you do right now but that means compressing all of what you do right now into half the time. The way to get there means that there's going to have to be more work that you're doing outside of board meetings to prepare for them. It also means there are some things that simply aren't going to make it onto the board meetings agenda anymore just because you're deprioritizing those so that you can prioritize whether or not your students are actually learning. Um, and so I don't think adding more meetings to your calendar gets you there. I think that will actually take you in the opposite direction. I think, in fact, you're more likely to get there by having fewer meetings and having them more focused on the things that you all say matter most. The question is, are you willing to engage in that level of discipline around student learning or not? I would say we are. And I think it has to be kind of what the motto has been about, you know, adult behavior. And, you know, and so, I know it's hard for President Adair to kind of say, hey, this is not what we should be doing right now, but I think it's important for us to understand why she's doing that um, and being mindful of that so that we can spend more time having the types of conversations we need to have to really make sure that we are student outcomes focused. So as an I statement, you know, I, I believe it is something that, you know, I am committed to and I believe we just have to make some, some small adjustments to get there. I totally agree as well. And, you know, one of the, this is maybe <laughs> a backdoor way of doing it, but, you know, one way we get those percentages to improve is if we start looking at things like community diet and that kind of thing. Yeah. But I think we need to do more time monitoring, so I don't want to suggest that we get our percentages better just by stopping having committee meetings. My part. <coughs> I am absolutely agreed about where we want to get to and that we want to improve outcomes and student achievement. That's without question. Um, Given the time that we've spent, um, I'm not entirely committed to this system of governance. I don't fully understand it. I am happy to work with all of you if that's the consensus of the board that this makes sense, and, and to do my part, and I will. Um, and, and we all have the same goal in mind. So I'm not going to get in the way. I just am, you know, feel a little bit differently than uh, some of the enthusiasts. Is there something we can do to help you understand it better? I'll volunteer um, AJ. He'll spend time telling you about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that would be. I'm not sure what that would look like. But let me give that some thought. And that is certainly that's one step, um, is without understanding fully, it's, it's even harder to make a commitment. So it makes sense. Yeah, that's incredibly reasonable. If it's not something that is understood or makes sense, then it's certainly not something that I would encourage you to um, devote yourselves to. The core idea here is that how the board spends its time matters and that the things that you spend more time on, you increase the likelihood that the school system is effective in those areas and the things that you spend less time on, 
you decrease the likelihood that the school system is effective in those areas. And so what the idea behind this work is that because we want student learning to be the area that the school system grows in effectiveness, effectiveness at, then you'd actually have to spend time doing that. Right now, you all do not. And so you grow in effectiveness at setting policies. You do not demonstrate effectiveness at actually monitoring policies to make sure they happen in reality. You continue to demonstrate effectiveness at talking about your values. You have not demonstrated effectiveness at actually honoring those values by monitoring to make sure that they're happening. So that's the core idea, is that what the board spends its time on matters. Um, and if the board spends more of its time on not really defining what its student learning uh, aspirations are, but on really monitoring what evidence do we have that we're moving and how are we responding to uh, new the availability of new evidence, to the extent that the board spends more and more of its time caught up in those things, the concept here is that that will increase the likelihood that the school system improves in that area. And so that, that's the core idea. The challenge is that you're already doing a bunch of stuff and that none of that stuff is unimportant, but that stuff is in fact directly in competition with what you say you want in terms of student learning. Um, and so the, the work of this um, framework is to help you identify what are ways that we could modify how we spend our time so that we are spending our time where we say we value, which is not the case now, as opposed to spending all of our time in areas that are certainly important, but are misaligned with the things that we say we value most, which is student learning. So that's the core concept is put your time, kind of put your money where your mouth is type of thing, put your time where you say your values are. Um, so either you all don't actually value student learning and your use of time is an accurate depiction of your values, or you do value student learning and your use of time is an inaccurate depiction of your values. You all first need to decide which of those is the case. And then when you make that decision, then you have to decide what, if anything, are we going to do about it? Thank you. Okay, thank you, AJ. Well, we didn't hear from Dr. Pierce. She just walked in. Walked I'm not in. sure she heard the whole oh. question. I mean, she, would you like to say something, Dr. Pierce? Can you repeat the question again? What it was, was HG's question? question. He was uh, asking what the consensus was, how committed we were to uh, continuing um, the student focus, which could mean, uh, you know, the ability to change our agendas or uh, just making sure, like you, you just heard him say, giving enough time to... Uh, ensure that we are doing the thing that we said we value most. And, and AJ, was what prompted you to weigh in that our percentages were not at um, where they would be? Oh, uh, they're not where you all said you wanted them to be. That's correct. Okay. Because we've had that conversation a lot about, you know, do we really, are we locked into these percentages or not? So I think that was why I was hoping to hear from Dr. Pierce on this. Um, so I think our board is committed to a version of um, this this governance model. I think uh, it is going to be a version that is in alignment with not just the express community values that we were able to kind of pull up and highlight in our guardrails, but also the underlining community values that create the, the reality in which our, our teachers, our educators are teaching our students and um, the conditions and environments in which our students and families are learning in. So let me be very clear in that. Right now we are dealing with a number of factors in our local community when we think about inequities, when we think about food injustice, when we think about housing affordability. Um, we're dealing with a number of issues within our district related to transportation, related to learning. As a board, sometimes that requires that we shift our focus to deal with those issues that are impacting student learning, and it may not always lend itself to the model of um, SOFG that other districts have embraced. 
And I am perfectly thrilled and excited that we don't do that acceptable model that other districts do, that we do veer off and we do what's best for our community. And so I think, again, we are open and committed to some variant, some version of this model. But we as a community, as a district, have some very key and critical issues that we need to tackle that um, deserve, command our attention more so than the implementation of this governance model as, um, as typically, typically run out. I actually don't disagree with your articulation. Um, I strongly disagree with your characterization of the board's current performance. To veer away from a focus on student outcomes presumes that you've demonstrated one. That is not yet in evidence. And that's what's in question, is to what extent does the board want to make clear its preoccupation with the learning of its students? Um, you all can certainly set kind of what you want that to look like and to, and and how that's measured, you all have done that. What's at point now as you conduct yourself evaluation is you all have not approached the things that you have said would be a demonstration of your focus uh, that you all would want that to look like. And so that invites the question, is it still your indication that you want to spend a significant amount of your time each month monitoring student performance? And if so, how much of your time do you want? And then I can work with you and work with your officers to identify that. If it is not your intention to invest a significant amount of your time, focus on student performance, then it would be better for you to acknowledge that um, so that we don't keep having the same conversation over and over every three months. I mean, I think we could go back and forth on this all night, but again, us looking at processes and operations that impact student learning is important. And if us looking at those processes and operations don't fall into the model as it's been created, again, um, I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm thrilled with that. They actually do fall in. They just don't fall in for 100% of the time or even 90% of the time. But the amount of time, that's for you all to determine. And so all I'm suggesting is you all need to say, what amount of your time do you want to focus on the student outcomes? And then I'll work with you all to accomplish that. Right now, what you all have said is you want to spend about half of your time focused on that. And if that's what you still want, then I'll certainly work with you on that. If what you want is a different percentage of that, then I'll work with you on that as well. But you all first need to decide what is it that you're trying to accomplish as a leadership team, and then I can help you all get to wherever that is. Okay. That sounds fine. We can do that. Is there any current indication, or is that a future conversation? Right. I really think it's a future conversation. I mean, I feel like, to be honest, we've missed a lot of our sessions with you, and I feel like we're behind on this. And then with just things that have happened in life, um, we uh, got behind. And so, I, you know, I, I know we're talking, AJ, about, uh, you know, having uh, another person help us, which I think is a great idea, um, and can kind of lean on us a little bit to, to help us through. So I, I think that maybe that's a, that's a future conversation. Because I, you know, I'm not sure half the time works because we have so many big, big problems yeah. that we are trying to figure out. And, but I, I think a significant time in comparison to all of it, I mean, like I said to uh, Dr. Brown who was up here, he was apologizing for how much time he was taking. That is literally the th reason we're all here and elected to sit in these chairs is our children and that how they learn and producing our portrait. And so, you know, it's, it's essential, but I'm not sure we can answer that right now at 8.30 uh, because this is a question we have struggled with since the beginning of this. Yeah. So uh, maybe we need another uh, coaching like group session to really lean in on that, talk about theory of action, hit a couple more of the committee diets or whatever it was that we still need to get done uh, so that we can kind of continue to move through uh, the, this process. I think just quickly, AJ, I would say yes, we are committed to being student focused. I think we need to figure out what that looks like because 
again, I've said it from the very beginning, I think, you know, we're looking at each month. Right now, I know that you want us to go to mm -hmm. one, one time a month. I get it. But uh, I think we could tr attempt to figure out one meeting can be student focused so that we can meet and continue our, our, our diet. And the other one could be these outstanding issues. As stated, we've had a couple of uh, derailments due to life. Uh, but I don't, I don't believe it's all or nothing. I, I do believe we have an opportunity to, to continue to guide us and get us to where we are every month um, having student-focused conversations and there may be a second meeting, or maybe we figure out how that goes into a consent agenda, uh, to your point, or how that is, um, uh, maybe uh, that focus goes into some sort of board debrief. I think we can figure that out as we continue to go forward, but um, I believe we are uh, committed to being, uh, to having some sort of rhythm of student-focused agendas with our uh, goals and guardrails. It's just how does that look like may be a little bit, um, a lot slower than we anticipated. But I, I do believe we're, we're heading there and that I think we can see proof of that in this red ink that's up there. Um, uh, but it's going to take us a little bit of time. I think we're committed to growth and not necessarily proficiency at this moment in time. <laughs> we're going to celebrate our growth just like we celebrate <laughs> our students' growth. Because we're all learning. This is yeah. all new. Well, and, and can I just add, I, I would appreciate a session where we, uh, among ourselves, establish some more clarity because, um, you know, I, I feel a little bit like I'm out ahead of everyone and I'm like, we got to do the implementation timeline and we got to do this and we got to do that. And, you know, I, I'll stop doing that if we're not there. Or, or if we decide where we are, then I'll do that. Um, and actually, so, I would appreciate that. I do feel we spend a lot of time in this world knowing full well that we're behind. And I'd rather spend time... We've been on this earlier conversation for 30 minutes. I rather would have preferred to spend some time focused on the calendar and seeing how we can get that on the, to your point, Carol, getting that, getting the work done versus discussing the fact that we haven't met, <laughs> met the numbers. Yeah. I mean, I would say we didn't move at all. I, I remember <laughs> yeah. we had there, like, I would say that's exactly where we are. I think a workshop focused on this uh, would be a good Okay, I agree. Yeah, we can definitely make that happen. You know, as a support in the next step and move in the direction you all want to go in. Uh, sorry, um, I uh, interrupted. We had just transitioned from monitoring to the next uh, item in the self evaluation. That's okay. I think we just did the self evaluation. Yeah. I'm not sure we moved <laughs> on any of them um, based on what we had looked at from January to March. Um, the remaining ones we were we didn't we didn't even we had zeros or ones on anyway. Right. I mean, does anyone disagree? Okay. So again, we'll just continue to work at it and improve and grow. Figure out what what we want to do. All right. Is there anything else we need to talk about on the implementation timeline? No, because I think that we got to figure out okay. where we are before we even worry about it. Um, I wanted to uh, have a discussion about board engagement. Um, we had talked about this before. Board member Beckerly, who, who was doing it? Uh, Vera and, and no, 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 it was Dr. Pierce. Uh, you yeah, three. us three. Sorry. But the reason you mentioned Carol is because Carol and um, Board Member Beckerly and Board Member Cole had pres presenting a SOFG model of right. engagement uh, that they went through and they practiced through that made sense. As she started talking, everyone, we all kind of looked at each other and said, oh boy, that's technically board engagement. Um, so um, uh, we felt that that's probably a good starting point uh, for the board to start discussions on actually following um, some of the, the model that she presented. You're looking at me like curious. Well, I think that there's there are a couple of things happened. Michael, board member Cole, and I did do about the SOFG piece and how do we get that out. And then that's, but there was also the the result of Dr. Pierce, board member Reyes, and my putting it. And we talked about all different categories of engagement. And then it, more recently, we talked about let's get moving on some part of it. 
and that triggered focusing on the piece about essentially office hours. And that, and, and the proposal that I generated had said, set up one Saturday a month and then rotating it through regions. So we'd have three locations in region one on the third Saturday and then three locations. And so then um, Dr. Pierce and I were in communication in the past week or so and she sent out the doodle poll saying, Saturdays aren't convenient to everyone. Let's find other times that are convenient. Um, and, and I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and I did my doodle poll right away to prove it. <laughs> but um, I, I think that there might be some wisdom in doing this in stages. And the first stage could be we pick a Saturday or you know, we pick a time and we schedule, pick a place and we do phase one or, you know, is every Saturday, every third Saturday of the month from one to three or every third Wednesday, I don't care what day it is, you know, we will be at X place and you can find a board member there. And then we wait to get the answers to Dr. Pierce's doodle poll and we say, okay, in addition to that third Saturday a month or whatever we pick, there's also going to be this time because this is more convenient for our families. And we just start to incrementally build it out rather than um, trying to find the time that works for all of us through the doodle poll because I'm afraid that's just, we're just going to lose more time and we could do this one piece pretty easily. So that, that's where I'm coming from with the engagement thing. I mean, I would agree. I think it's 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 time. Like, we need to be able to have some engagement with our community, and that's why we want to figure out what makes sense. Um, but to Dr. Pierce's point as well, like, we have to think about meeting our families where they're at, and so that is going to require some evenings or a weeknight or a week morning, um, and so making sure that we are making it accessible, because I'm also not interested in having a meeting that works for me and not my, no one else, which I know we all feel the same about that. So I, I think we have to look at our engagement plan in pieces, as uh, Board Member Beckerly said. So I, I'm open and ready to start this process. So I, I think we as a collective just needs to figure out when and when do we just put that first date out and, and just, you know, advertise that so families can come and have that time with us. Or other community members. Or, yeah, or other community members, for sure. So... Um, if, if I could just add, um, what I appreciate about uh, this, this phase or this model that's being brought forward is that it gives us an opportunity to provide flexibility for not just our families and community members, but also for board members. Um, as I listen to AJ offer additional workshops and sessions, um, again, I want to remind us to be models for uh, what we expect to see in our teachers and our, our educators, right? So we've told them to um, practice self-care and wellness and not to over-schedule. So again, I want to make sure that we're not over-scheduling. And by giving um, all of us the opportunity to go into our calendars and look at which days work best for us. So again, um, understanding that Fridays might not, uh, Saturdays might not always be the best day for everybody, even if it is the third Saturday or the fourth Saturday or a month, right? There might be some weekdays that are better for people. And also understanding that the time for so the doodle poll does give, I think it's a 9 to 12 time frame, a 1 to 3 time frame, and a 4 to 7 time frame that we're breaking it up and providing, again, that diversity of day and time so we're meeting our community members where they are. Um, I would like to add that I would like us to give more thought and consideration to who we may have also attend these sessions with us. So as today, we saw there are some transportation concerns that our community members have. So in these upcoming meetings, do we invite um, our director of transportation to come and to serve, uh, you know, answer questions with us? Do we invite um, Alex Trevino to come out and to be able to answer some questions with us? Do we invite our instructional assistants and other teachers and coaches to also come out and meet the community? I think those are some things that we should really give some thought to in addition to how we kind of do these phases. I think, again, it will be very easy for us to say, everybody go to the doodle poll, you know, every three months and pick out which days and times work for you. 
the locations can be identified centrally by Dr. Dixon and her team, or else if there are some local spots in our communities that we want to expose people to, Miss Ina's um, Upper Cup, um, Silo Cafe, there's so many restaurants um, that are opened, or coffee shops that are open by CCS alums that give us a great opportunity to also introduce the community to. So I think we definitely um, want to provide that opportunity and space for not just our community members, but also for our for ourselves. Brown. Yeah, I, the one thing with with that <clears throat> that I think we need to be careful about, and that is our imposing on our staff. Um, you know, this is uh, presumably not necessarily work hours. Um, it's it's. These are people that work for the superintendent and, you know, and are directed by, by her primarily or by our treasurer. Uh, and I, I think we just need to be you know, cautious as we go about that. Um, and in general, the burdens that we place on uh, our administrative team. And, and I appreciate that. I think that's why I'm also saying that we invite them and we, and we talk about who, who can we invite and when can we invite them, like what's the best time to invite our coaching staff? Is it, you know, spring and fall right before they have their coaches meeting with all the families and students? Um, the other thing that I would add to that to not be a burden to our administration, when it was first presented, all the meetings were at our schools on a Saturday, right? So that will require our custodials to go in on Saturdays, to open up buildings, to clean up buildings. So by, um, again, adding this flexibility of location and, and going out to locations in our community, it also helps us to pull that burden, relieve that burden from administration in our buildings. Vice President Reyes. So I would like to uh, go back and like um, share the document um, that was previously introduced by Beckerly and Cole so everyone could look. It was very specific to board work. Uh, it was very, sp there was two opportunities. I think one was uh, a specific topic and uh, another one was, another potential was um, to just have open board hours so that the community could have conversations with us. Um, to Board Member Brown's point, we are having engagement sessions via Zoom that Dr. Dixon and her team have, have opened up. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't possibly do one or two that would invite um, staff, but I, I, um, the way that it was presented was this is, this is board engagement, opportunity for the board to have, uh, to go out into the community, hear from our constituencies to that point, coming back and then saying, oh, we got a thousand questions, I'm just making this up, a thousand questions on X. So maybe we should have, um, you know, bring that back to the administration and say, hey, this is an issue we need to have or perhaps suggest to them either have a presentation during the board meeting or having an additional uh, administrative focused um, session uh, just to add to the comment I'm not uh, discounting one or the other but um, I, I believe the the goal of the public engagement the model that Beckerly and Cole uh, put forth um, was about the board spending time um, out in the community versus the administration and it is a little bit more difficult for us because we don't have people we don't have staff <laughs> Even though people think, think we have staff, we don't have staff. Um, in an uh, office. <laughs> in, a in an office. And, 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 Nor and should old, we or, you know, have any of those things. Well, it would be helpful for some of the <laughs> things that we, we, um, we get. But nonetheless, um, so there is, um, I'd like to kind of dive into that a little bit more and share that with the rest of the board, not stopping the fact that we should um, possibly start as early, if not this month, next month, for our first office hours, keeping in mind again um, that uh, we would have three to four uh, board members at each session. Um, so just putting that out there. Okay, so uh, can I kind of maybe 
clear back with you what I'm thinking in terms of maybe how we move forward and taking in everything that you've all said. So if we commit to doing, uh, to get started, doing one open office hour um, that uh, can be scheduled through the doodle poll, um, that would just be an open session, maybe no topics. Um, and then we will then look at what other type of events the administration is already doing to see what makes sense for us to tag in on, just like the um, the back to school fair. Like we, we had a table ourselves and that was very great to engage with families as the board. Um, and then we need to uh, get a better strategy about more of, you know, the things like, you know, how are we aligning and what data are we collecting? How is this driving our decision making? How is this impacting um, and figuring out a model? Um, but I don't want to lose any, we need to be out there. We've said this to our community ever since we changed the rules about public speaking. So I feel like that's, that's kind of a consensus about where we are. Um, Dr. Pierce, since you sent out the doodle poll, would do you mind leading that effort to get us the one uh, office hour? The two. Two? Was it two we're committing to? Well, we so got Saturday. Fine. We got Saturday. Well, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll roll out a whole calendar yeah. because I think as people determine and identify what days are best for them, we might actually come up with more than two sessions, yeah. right? Let's commit to just, yeah, I hear you. Let's commit to just the one though first and uh, do it as a, as a test and then we can build the calendar out um, because I don't think every session should just be an open session either. Like right. We have things we need to get back from our community uh, with all of the things that we are working on, um, including you know the, the goals and guardrails, including uh, levy. Incl there's just so many things that we actually need uh, to gather data. Um, and so I, I do think we need to be strategic in how we're going out. And it could be different different sessions. I mean, I think that's what Ramona was pointing yeah. out in terms of the document that right. was created. So, I'm he but I he I'm hearing that we have consensus on for this month. Yes, we start with yes. the month and then yes. we'll see where people identify. And again, we might come up with one day where people are available or multiple days where, oh, two are available here, three are available here. Everybody's done one. I just want to thank Ramona for the reminder that these should be about board matters, not administrative matters. And that makes a difference. All right, thank you. So everyone please fill out the um, doodle poll and then Dr. Pierce will loop back with everybody. Yes. Perfect. All right, we're gonna move into item eight. We have two notice of public hearing on reemployment of retired hearings. This really just requires me to read the public notice. Uh, so here we are, 8.1. Um, notice a public hearing on reemployment of retired employee Anna P. Bennett. Pursuant to Harvard Revised Code section 3309.345, the Columbus Board of Education gives notice that Anna P. Bennett, teacher who retired from the Columbus City Schools effective May 31, 2013, is seeking employment with the Columbus City Schools as a teacher effective November 16, 2022. The board will hold a public hearing on November 15, 2022, at 5 30 in the boardroom at 3700 South High Street. Columbus, Ohio, on the issue of Ms. Bennett's reemployment. 8.2, notice a public hearing on reemployment of retired teacher K Carol M. Kamada. Pursuant to Ohio Revised Code, section 33.09.345, the Columbus Board of Education gives notice that Carol M. Kamada, teacher who retired from Columbus City Schools effective June 30, 2022, is seeking employment with the Columbus City Schools as a teacher effective November 16, 2022. The board will hold a public hearing on November 15, 2022 at 5.30 in the boardroom at 3700 South High Street, Columbus, Ohio, on the issue of Ms. Kamada's reemployment. All right, now into uh, item nine, which is our consent agenda. This evening, our consent agenda consists of item 10.1 to 25.2. Are there any items a board member would like to remove for separate vote? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion. Second. Been a motion and a second. Are there any items any member would like to discuss? Um, item 16.2. Item 16.2, authority to enter into agreement to purchase document scanning services from SC Strategic Solutions. Go ahead, Board Member Vera. Okay, so my question for this, you know, I'm 
happy to see that we're moving kind of into this digital space. But with that also comes questions in regards to risk and how do we mitigate that risk. And so my question specifically about this move is, it says here that we are going to be digitizing documents into one system. I want to understand who owns that system. Are we owning that system or is this company owning that system? And essentially what is our, like our process for now entering kind of into this cyber digital space with our documents? So um, first, the main reason is that our warehouse at Hudson, we've accumulated a lot of records, and so those need to be digitized, and then we own the digital copy of those, and then they'll go into a system that we can retrieve as needed. Is it, Dr. James, is it like a cloud? Like, I guess I want to understand the system is this a system we have been using? Is this something we're building with the intention of using it moving forward to put all of our stuff into this place? Yeah, this is an add-on to another department that's been using the service. So these, a lot of this information will be housed um, in the cloud versus servers that were, you know, that like are that are at Kingswood. Um, we have we're working with a consultant not related to this project. Um, THM Solutions to give some recommendations for moving more of those types of hard servers that we're using into the cloud. At another district I worked at, we used Blue Bridge in Cuyahoga County and moved most of our servers and information off into the cloud, where they do the backups, maintain the security, and keep that access for us at all times. Okay, thank you. And then I guess my Kind of my final question in regards to kind of future strategy projecting, um, do you foresee us needing to, you know, in terms of like our security analysts, if, or is that something we're going to have to really grow to be able to manage a move like this? And, and kind of what is the forecast for that? Like we're starting with this piece, but when exactly can we expect to have more of an actual cyber team to help us with this process? We have a cyber team, but, you know, this gets to what Mr. Bohorik was saying earlier, you know, just in terms of all of these decisions that we're making have staff implications. And in my world, I try to make sure that we're mitigating the need to add staff versus having a service that can provide a lot of that in the background for us so we don't have to rely on so many. Mm -hmm. We need some, but I don't think with this system and systems like it that we would need a whole cadre of staff to do that. We would need some people, but we also would rely on, you know, the service to handle many of those things that we would have to, you know, handle additional people to do that ourselves. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I guess just kind of looking at, you know, some of our past audits and just our planning, like really thinking through what is just maybe not even the operational, but what is our procedure for our cyber elements and how do we make sure that these companies have the right licensure? How do we make sure that the vendors have the right type of security and how are we, you know, especially like the people who come to pick up these documents, right? We're trusting that there's some level of a background check or, you know, so just thinking about what is our kind of our say and how our documents are handled, how they're scanned, and how do we hold these other parties accountable in the event that there is some type of operational or reputational risk with hiring, you know, these contractors to do such heavy lifting? Like right, this? and I think Mr. McCormick addressed that in a previous question um, regarding the qualifications that are in the contract for the background checks for those folks and to pass, you know, uh, some type of security requirements in order to do the work. And we, I just, I guess I want to under, I just want to make sure that we have our kind of operational procedure of these are the things we're asking for and the things that these contracted vendors are in fact able to provide us to say, all right, even though there's still risk, right? And we know we, we assume some level of risk, but I guess as we're moving into this cyber world that we are in, I want to think about, you know, our servers versus servers that belong to someone else or, you know, how do our firewalls, you know, are we prepared to be more digital ties with all the documents and the things that we're moving towards? I think we are and we're moving towards that direction and our insurance carriers are, are requiring us to have those procedures in place. Okay. Thank you.
Can I j jump on that? Maybe ask uh, General Counsel Barnes. Do we have in our standard contracts any security language? Like for these companies? Like do we have standard security, like measurement standards that they have to meet? Like is that already part of our contracts? I can answer that. Uh, this is Vandana. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Are you talking you my know? language now? <laughs> um, so I can answer the question for you, um, uh, President Adair. Uh, we don't have, most of the time it is built into the contract of the SOW, and uh, our team looks closely for that. And um, we do vet them security-wise. And uh, we ask those questions, and we do ask for proof, and we also have data sharing agreements with uh, every vendor that we do business with. Okay, because I'm just thinking about my work in the state, and we have very stringent standard language and security questions in the RFPs and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, um, we do ask for... Operating there, uh, we are, um, um, you know, it may not be in the RFP, but we definitely vet the vendor for um, security, their security posture and what risk can we ask them to indemnify any risk that we might endure in the end to a board member whereas point. Thank you. Becker, Burn Beckerly. Yeah, I, I kind of want to circle around on this a little bit too um, because a variation of concern about this risk came up at our um, audit and accountability meeting on Thursday and um, our, our community members in particular um, Mr. Jordan from Nationwide stressed about how this is an ever-changing area this cyber risk and cyber security and um, how uh, we need to be incredibly vigilant about it and it's not our area per se so it'd be really easy for us to perhaps not know what it is we should be doing. <laughs> and um, in particular, what was identified as a concern at the, Thursday, at the audit and accountability meeting was that um, in the past we have outsourced uh, the firm, what's the firm's name again, Carolyn? The firm that does the... We've admin, outsourced some, um, the, some, uh, the some, annual audit, review. some IT audit work. To Schneider Downs. Schneider Downs, to do an annual review to identify where the risk areas were. Um, and we didn't do this year in part because we have in-house capability for that. Um, but nonetheless, I think that for something like this, because we're basically handing over all kinds of data that could or, uh, to people and having them process it and store it, that could have all kinds of um, confidentiality implications, HIPAA, FERPA, um, we should make sure that we've really kicked the tires on um, our requirements and their capacity to protect these documents and handle them well. And that, that's just what I want to say. It was a ha highlighted as an area that we need to be extra vigilant about. Uh, any other items? 22.3. Um. 22.3. Uh, authority to enter into a purchase of services agreement with Hard integrators. Um, the question in particular just kind of relates to a number of emails that I've received from concerned parents about the student ID number being on the front of the card. Um, is there any, well, one, hi, Dr. Klein. Is it normal that the student ID number is included, like, on, on documents publicly? And do we have to include it on the front of this card? You're muted. Board President Adair to Dr. Pierce's question, I just want to share with you that this was the prototype of the card. We can actually change along with our communications department and safety and security department we can change that card to be anything we want it to be. Remember that was one of the things that the Columbus Metropolitan Library requested that we have on the card. So we would have to go through some changing, but it is possible. Student, their student ID is part of directory information though now. Okay, and that student so ID- yes, it is possible. So 
when one has access to the student ID number and say we walk into a school and we give that student ID number, can it then give an individual access to other information about that student? No, it cannot, ma'am. Is there? Absolutely um, not. They would have to have their appropriate other identifying identifier. Um, it's a number. It's their email. It's though. the beginning of the it's email, student email accounts, the numeric. Which, which is also how they log into computers and access and our their system. Birthday. So it, it is. I, so the. It, it's also their date of birth. It's a combination. And I know that Wandana has been working on um, identification, authentication, but at this time, that's what we use. Okay. So. I guess I just want to bring it to the board's attention, to administration's attention, that a number of parents are concerned that having access to that information on that card, other students can potentially use it, other people can potentially use it. Um, we just want to ensure that whatever information on that card, an individual can't walk into a school and gain access to a student's records or gain access to be able to check books out at a local library. I don't know. We just want to make sure we're protecting our students. So, Dr. Pierce, to answer your question with regard to the library, the student would have to be present with their student success card in order to check that book out. They cannot just check it out without having a picture ID. Okay. But they could reserve it for pickup? Uh, I believe so. I can check that out and get back to you, but I believe you are correct. Okay. That, that just concerns me because if you can reserve it for pickup, then in some instances, and I've done this before for my children, I go in and pick up the book without having their photo ID and it's under Yeah, I would have to check on that, but I certainly can check and get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, any other? Um, I did want to point one out because we have our executive director of City Year here, um, <laughs> Daryl Robertson. Um, we have item 15.1, authority to enter into a purchase agreement with City Year. Um, our City Year team is amazing. We love them. They are in eight of our schools, Champion, Lyndon McKinley, Livingston, uh, Mifflin, South, Trevitt, Starling, and Windsor. Uh, the program, the, the Red Jackets, um, they're out there welcoming our students, being there for them. They're near peer mentors. Um, and, you know, we love it too when our kids go and become core members um, and then, you know, come back and, and become our city year team. I want to invite Executive Director Robinson up to the podium. He stuck it out the whole meeting. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> he's here um, to say a few words um, about, you know, city year and the partnership. Good evening. Good evening. How are you all doing today? Good. Good. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, President Adair, Vice President Reyes, Superintendent Dixon, and board members. I just uh, wanted to say I wanted to be here in case you had any questions about the program, what we plan on doing this year, and to thank you for all of your support of City of Columbus, not only this year, but over the past 20 plus years of City Year's existence. So I just wanted to say that. And uh, if you had any questions about the program, about our core members, about our service, about our academic interventions, our SEL work, please feel free to contact me. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there any other items anyone would like to highlight? All right, hearing none, please call the roll. Mr. Brown? Yes. Dr. Pierce? Yes. Vice President Reyes? Yes. Ms. Vera? Yes. President Adair? Yes. Ms. Beckerly? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. And with that, I will just need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, without objection, we are adjourned.